Okay, Chair, we're now streaming live on YouTube. I'll hand the meeting to you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to East Devon District Council's Cabinet meeting on the 2nd of February 2021. Uh, I'm your Chair, Councillor Paul Arnott, and welcome to anyone watching via live streaming. Based on the Council's decision to continue virtual meetings until the 11th of May this year, can I remind members and the public attending or watching that this Council has delegated much of its decision-taking power to our senior officers, and may I remind members that the Code of Conduct applies throughout this meeting. We also reserve the right to remove and disconnect any participant who is disrupting the meeting by whatever means. Please turn off any telephone devices or set to silent, which I will now do. In the event of a break in the internet connection, we'll try and re-establish it as fast as possible, but if we can't, after 15 minutes, we will have to adjourn and reconvene at a later date. If you wish to make a comment, uh, please raise your electronic hand and wait to be called. The agenda tonight is at eastdevon.gov.uk, and we'll now start the meeting by doing a roll call of Cabinet Committee members here present. Amanda, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with yourself, Councillor Arnott. Present. Councillor Haywood. Present, thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Present. Councillor Hookway. Present, thank you. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Young. Present. Councillor Ledger. Present, thank you, Amanda. Councillor Loudon. Present, thank you. Councillor Rickson. Present, thank you. And Councillor Rowland. Present, thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I can confirm we are core at tonight. OK, thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, let's now go to agenda item one, public speaking. And there's a slightly unusual element to this tonight. So uh, is Mr. Mike Goodman there already? And can we he bring is, Chair, in? yes. OK. Hello, Mr. Goodman. Are you receiving me? Over. Yes, I am. OK, thank you very much. So, Mr. Goodman, I'd just like, before we start, I'm just trying to understand where we are in, in the correspondence process you've, you've got with the Council. So I, th I think you've already asked a few questions. Is that right in emails? Yes. OK, and you've had answers to those. Yes. And then tonight, what is it you want to do? Ask another question or...? Well, I'm going to make a statement, which I, I understand, Chairman, I'm allowed three minutes, and I will cover some of the points that are particularly focusing on climate change. OK, thank you. And then, all right, well, so... And then our portfolio holder, Councillor Marianne Rick, will be kind enough to answer after that, because you've been kind enough to give her sight of what you're about to say. Uh, some of which I'll come back to afterwards as well. But if you're ready to go. Yes, Chairman, what I would add, I'm quite happy. I understand it, it is three minutes long. And if there are things that you haven't had time, because I, I was away today and could only send it uh, late this afternoon, quite understand you having to send me details of some of the answers at a later date. That's not a problem. Oh, no, I, I mean, I think having seen the statement, Mr Goodman, uh, it has to be answered tonight and it will be. So okay. um, over to DSO to control your three minutes, please. Yes, you start when you're ready, Mr Goodman. Okay. I would like to thank the Cabinet member, supported by the officer for replying to my questions and appreciate the time that has been given in providing this response. And I commend the Cabinet for agreeing a climate change action plan at the Cabinet meeting on the 8th of January 2020. But it's regrettable that I cannot trace any evidence that four counts ever debated this issue. There is no reference also for the updates on the action plan to be brought back to council. I also commend the council for supporting the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill at full council on April 2021. But disappointed the council did not action recommendation three to write to the local MP Simon, J Simon Jupp. I'm sure this was an oversight. And I would ask that the council write to Mr. Jupp to seek his support. I also support the cabinet report of the 17th of March regarding the EVs and the 30 EV points being put forward for East Devon. The report said that the first four would be implemented in 2021, but I, I do not see any evidence these first four have been done so. And I wonder if we can have an update from the cabinet member. 
The Climate Action Plan contains 81 important actions. And in the reply, I'm told that these were too many to comment on. But what I would say is all I'm really after is confirmation that the 62 actions have either been completed or when were they completed? And could we have an update from the cabinet member after the meeting or during the meeting on the 81 action points? Now, trees form an important element for any climate action change plan, yet there's no reference to trees in the 81 actions that I can see. A tree strategy was debated at full council on the 27th of July 2021, and it was agreed that the overview committee would deliver a scope and an indicative report for the development of a tree strategy. Yet I can find no details that this has taken place. When will the overview committee deliver on this important commitment? It is disappointing that when I look at the cabinet member's responsibilities for climate and her deputy, I do see just one responsibility, which is one line which says climate action and emergency response. All other cabinets have a list of responsibilities. And can I ask the council leader to provide an update on their response, important responsibility so members are aware of what outcomes the leader expects to be delivered by these cabinet members? Can I ask the council to produce a tree strategy? 30 seconds and, left. And work with others in so doing. Can I finally ask that the Climate Action Plan is formally discussed each year by full council and enable residents to be kept informed through simple com communication plans? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr Goodman. Now, I know that our portfolio holder, Marianne Ritson, has a, uh, a reply that she could read out at this stage, but uh, that is up to Councillor Rickson if she wishes to do so, or is indeed able to do so. Marianne, what, what, what do you um, like? Well, I believe, I believe that uh, Mr Goodman has already had a copy of the reply, but if uh, the committee would like me to read out the reply, then I'm happy to do so. But as regards to um, responding to his supplementary, please note that I was in a meeting from half past three to half past four, followed by another meeting from half past four to half past five. Then I had something to eat because I only had half an hour between meetings. So I'm unable to respond Understand. in detail to the questions he's, you know, have as a supplementary. That's understandable. Okay, yes, that's why, do you remember when I said I thought this was not the ideal process earlier, Mr. Go uh, Goodman, but um, anyway, I congratulate you. you, you seem to have a forensic understanding or um, you know, partial understanding of, <laughs> of the constitutional workings of the council in this regard. Yes. A lot of it is incorrect, which I think you'll find in a minute. So I'll come back to that. Um, Marianne, if you're happy to do so, could you, because I think it's really useful. Um, if you would like me to read out the answers that we gave to his original question. Yes, please. Do so now. Yeah. Okay, so the answers given were, thank you for your questions and interest in our climate change agenda. In relation to the tree strategy, we fully recognise the importance of trees to our environment and have aspirations to cover the existing, to, sorry, to protect the existing treescape and increase canopy cover. Officers have already drafted a high level tree strategy. The funding request is to undertake some of the detailed survey mapping and treescape work to ensure that the strategy is bespoke and relevant to East Devon. We also need this funding to roll out the inevitable actions arising from the strategy. We have found a way of funding this work and will do so from the existing climate change budget. In terms of progress against our climate change action plan, there are too many things that we are doing to mention them all. So I'll highlight a number and hope to put more detailed reports on our website in the future as we develop it to improve communications. However, to give you a flavor of what we have been doing, I would cite climate change is a, a key priority for the council demonstrated by my appointment as portfolio holder for climate action, and I'm supported by Councillor Denise Brickley as assistant portfolio holder. The council has also appointed a climate change officer. As a major employer, all of our council services have an important contribution to make towards climate change. We signed up to the Devon Climate Emergency Declaration, quickly followed by the production of an ambitious climate change strategy and action plan. Our, our council plan was updated in the autumn and features climate change as a corporate priority. Our individual service plans covering each council department all include a section on climate change actions that our various services will be progressing. We have contributed towards the Devon Carbon Plan, working with other local authorities 
and statutory and voluntary organisations committed to tackling climate change. We have undertaken an updated organisational carbon footprint, that was 2020-21, working with the University of Exeter. This shows a reduction from the baseline year 2018-19 of 22%. However, we recognise that there is a pandemic effect, which is likely to be distorting the figures. We have increased our recycling rate and are proud this is now exceeding 60% of household waste recycling, zero to landfall, and have introduced a green waste collection scheme that is composted in the district. We have rolled out programs of tree planting, rewilding and nature recovery on our land and in partnership with local landowners. We have appointed a district ecologist dedicated to achieving biodiversity net gain and improving our ecology. We have electrified a third of our white vehicle fleet. We are installing electric vehicle charging points in offices, depots and car parks as part of our green travel plan with plans to expand further we have rolled out carbon literacy training for members and senior officers. We are amending our local plan and planning policy to reflect our climate change ambitions. We have run a, a, sorry, we have run a climate conversations program linking art, culture and our environment with climate change to engage our residents in the council's ambitions. We are involved in district heating programs, green growth and the electrification of flights at Exeter Airport. We will be undertaking a full review of our climate change strategy and action plan in late summer after the Devon Carbon Plan has been published to ensure alignment and demonstrate the progress we've made since signing up to the Devon Climate Emergency. Finally, we recently scored 78% in an assessment by Climate Emergency UK reported in The Guardian on the 27th of January 2022, placing us third highest as a non-metropolitan district and 15th highest across the whole of the UK for our climate change plan. However, we are not complacent and recognise that we have a long way to go on our journey to net zero. Now, I believe we've already had a copy of my notes, but if not, I'd be very happy to send them to you. Thank you very much, Councillor Rickson. Um, so if it, I hope you don't find this impertinent, um, Councillor Goodman, but you, 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 I think you're, you're quite knowledgeable in this area because you were a cabinet member for environment and planning. Is that correct? You obviously uh, have done your homework well. Yes, I was. At, in Surrey? Correct. And you, are you, do you live down here now or are you still I've in I've lived in Sidmouth since the second week of August. Okay, great. Well, it's wonderful to have somebody so knowledgeable here. Does that answer help at all? I mean, well, I've read that answer, but it actually doesn't... It doesn't address any of the points I've got there in as much as um, there are a number of issues I've asked for clarification on. And mm. um, I don't think any of those have been answered because I would not have asked those questions tonight or mm. made that statement if the original answers, which, um, thank, as, as I said, I have received, had answered mm. them. No, I understand that. That's why I think in future, I think help, let, let, let's try and do this in a less ambushy way. If what we want to do is get real detail, let's let's do it through email correspondence mm -hmm. and then at the appropriate moment when we all know what everybody knows then come forward with the questions i think that's the most helpful thing to say a, a lot of what you say is not correct it's quite hard it's oh, obviously on a busy agenda but in particular i think you'll see later um that um we uh, as part of an agenda item around next year's budget uh, we are trying to make a huge move on the on uh, on council uh, spending around the tree strategy. So, yeah, but what you, did, with the greatest respect, chairman, what did I say was wrong about trees? Um, you mentioned a tree strategy. Yeah, I mentioned a tree strategy and the fact that there was no mention of trees in the action plan that was agreed. Um, previously by the council. So that's all I said about trees and I've asked okay. for an action plan and the fact that it was going to be looked at by the, the um, overview committee. Okay, brilliant. All right, well, thank you very much. So I'm sure what will happen is you'll get a written response to your further. But as a, again, as a general rule, it's quite a, a valued sacred space, this ability for the public to speak. So I think if we can follow a process all the way through in writing, and then come to speak. That's so okay. Come back to next cabinet, please. If you, I if will you, do. Thank you very much for your time this evening. And welcome to Sidmouth. And I'm sure Thank the uh, 
Conservative Party in Surrey will, will miss you greatly. Um, <laughs> right, now, if we come back, please, to the agenda, uh, which is just a small matter of me uh, finding my script on screen, which is going to be here. There we are. Right, we now go to agenda item two, the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, if anyone has a comment on the set of minutes from the 5th of January 2022, please do so by raising your electronic hand. Uh, but if I see no hands raised, I'll take this as an indication that you agree the minutes of the previous meeting. So I'm now looking out for electronic hands. And I can see none, so thank you very much. Uh, the minutes of the previous meeting are recommended to be agreed. Uh, agenda item three is apologies. Uh, Amanda, do we have any apologies this evening, please? Uh, just from uh, one non-cabinet member, and that's Councillor Mike Allen. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to Councillor Allen for giving his apologies. Uh, can we now do a roll call of the declarations of interest of cabinet again by Amanda? Thank you, Chair. I'll start with yourself, Councillor Arnott. Uh, none, thank you. Councillor Haywood. Thank you. May I just give a personal uh, uh, interest in item 18, uh, the clean growth vision for development um, in my um, <coughs> nominated role as a director of Exeter Science Park and a member of the uh, airport <coughs> consultative board. And also item 17, um, just as chair of the ARG panel. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Uh, none, thank you. Councillor Hookway. Uh, uh, none, thank you. Councillor Jackson. None at this moment, thank you. Councillor Young. Uh, none, thank you. Councillor Ledger. None that I'm aware of this time, thank you, Amanda. Councillor Loudon. None, Amanda, thanks. Councillor Rickson. Um, just that I am a, a member of the Sidmouth Town Council and there's a, an article about, an item about Sidmouth changing rooms on the agenda. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Rowland. Thanks, Amanda. Similar to Councillor Haywood, same agenda item as I'm a shareholder representative on the Exeter Science Board of Directors. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda. Um, agenda item five is late items or matters of urgency, and we have three late reports. At item 12, the minutes of the Arts and Culture Forum are from the 20th of January this year. Item 22, the refurbishment of Sidmouth changing rooms just mentioned. And item 23, business rates, COVID-19 additional relief fund, known as the CARF fund. Um, one other late item that I'll deal with now, which is just um, something that's come through this afternoon. So I'm, I'm going to give a quick uh, informational uh, statement uh, for members that I hope, I hope is helpful about the levelling up fund, because I was this afternoon at, in a Team Devon meeting where this was discussed. Um, members will be aware that the Leveling Up Fund white paper was published this afternoon, and I know that our CEO has distributed various uh, documents relating to that to members. Um, the supporting analysis is focused on spatial disparities and then refers to 12 missions or key issues which need systemic reform. Now, you'll have read that Devon, including Plymouth and Tor Bay, is one of the first nine areas invited to put forward uh, an informal combined authority approach. The government, in correspondence to Devon County Council CEO Phil Norrie today, confirmed that we, that is Team Devon plus Plymouth and Tor Bay, have satisfied the criteria and that we have a, open quotes, sensible economic geography, close quotes. Also, crucially, the government's aspiration is to have concluded these deals by the autumn. 
Uh, let's hope so, because Team Devon, we first approached the government last July, putting forward a, a combined bid. So speed will now be of the essence. Uh, there are two immediate questions that arise. Um, how does Team Devon expand to include Plymouth and Tor Bay? And does all this come with plentiful hard cash, or is it just window dressing? To that end, uh, we decided at Team Devon today to meet again urgently in the next fortnight to answer these and to be in the process of identifying our strategic requests moving forward. So I thought I'd let you know that today, um, just hot off the presses, so to speak. Item six, agenda item six then, confidential or exempt items. And there is one confidential or exempt item which officers recommend should be dealt with in this way later. And we'll go into part B for that. Agenda item seven is the forward plan. Are members happy to recommend the forward plan as it stands for approval? Um, Henry, do I need to take a vote on that or just... Um, do it by nobody putting their hands up. Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, so I'll take that as agreed unless I see hands flying up and there are no hands, so thank you very much. That is therefore agreed. Agenda item eight, and the minutes of the Asset Management Forum held on the 5th of January, 2022. Um, now, do members wish to make any particular recommendations on this item? or can we agree to move this forward without specific recommendation? Again, hands up, please, if there are any things you would wish to add or question. If not, I'll take it we can uh, move this forward without specific recommendations. Thank you. Agenda item nine is the minutes of the Strategic Planning Committee held on the 11th of January, 2022. And there is a cabinet recommendation that can be found on page 19 of the agenda, which I'm flying to as fast as I possibly can at the moment. Uh, where are we? 22, 21. Yes. It is recommended. I think this is correct, Henry. Uh, minute 64, a clean growth vision for development in the west of the district. Is that the one we're looking at? That's correct, Chair, and it is item 18 on your agenda, so I think you would just take the minutes into account at, at item 18. Brilliant. Thank you very much, in which case we'll move on from that as well, uh, assuming that you're happy to move forward, Cabinet, and you all are. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have the minutes of the Joint Overview and Scrutiny Committee held on the 12th and the 17th of January 2022, and again, we have specific cabinet recommendations on page 63 of the agenda. I'm slightly hampered tonight that my third computer is giving me microscopic size font but for some reason I can't immediately deal with. If, if it helps, Chair, again, I'd recommend that those are taken into account on item 13 because they relate to the setting of the budget. Okay. That's where you'll need to consider those. Could you remind me at that point, please, Henry? Only in as much as I'm blind, slightly blind on one screen. Thank you very much. Um, we then move on to agenda item 11, the minutes of the Housing Review Board held on the 13th of January, 2022. And we have, again, uh, recommendations found on, hold on, page 63 of the agenda. Isn't that what we've just done? No. Okay. Is that right? Yes. So we have recommend these are recommendations from the Housing Review Board. Am I getting into a mess here, Henry? I'm looking at it's page. A bit more tricky, Chair, because the uh, there's a split here. So minute twenty three from the Housing Review Board will also need to be considered on item thirteen uh, to do with the draft budgets. But the rest the, the rest are for consideration. So if you were to agree that minute twenty three gets taken into account later, <coughs> but you can deal with the remainder. Thank you. Depending entirely upon your memory, please, Henry, for 23 to come up later. Yep. Cabinet, we're, we're being asked to agree 17, 24, 25 and 26 from the Housing Review Board. Uh, do we have any comments from outside the Cabinet on those, please, first? 
and there is uh, Councillor Brewster Sarum, please. Yes, um, so, sorry, Chairman. I, I, I wanted to comment on the overview meeting of the 12th of January. Um, I, I was sorry, I, I did have my hand raised and I apologise for quick raising it. I, I just want to say that I wasn't present at the time of the overview meeting, but I did catch up with it. And, and I am concerned that, for example, the mayor of Exmouth wasn't happy with the proposal put forward. He gave good reasons why, and others expressed the need for consistency across the whole of the district. I would ask that more consultation is done with the stakeholders, like, for example, the Exmouth Chamber of Commerce, to see if their members are concerned about this and the impact it will have on visitors at a time when we want vibrant town centres post-COVID. I feel that this proposal is a, by the overview committee is a rushed attempt to balance the council's books and it doesn't take into account factors like the emerging Exmouth camper van TAF proposals suggested by Andrew Ennis to raise revenue from the camper van parking. So I think that with the greatest respect to members that this is not the right strategy and I hope that amendments can be made to make car parking work for our numerous visitors who rely on the car to get from A to B with reasonable charge made for car parking. As members said, I conclude, as members said the themselves a price rise doesn't necessarily lead to more revenue being raised so that's what I just wanted to interject in that debate and I apologize it skipped an item chair I know my apologies as well Councillor the Sarum for not seeing your hand up um, and actually what you've just said becomes late, uh, relevant uh, a little bit later when we're looking at the uh, budget um, so but thank you for that okay coming back now to agenda item 12 the minutes of the Arts and Culture Forum held on the 20th of January 2022. And again, we have in our agenda on page 71. Yeah, I apologise, but I don't... with uh, item 11, yeah. Yeah, I haven't finished item 11 yet. Okay, what else do we need to do there, Henry? Do we need to vote Wait. on that? Well, you need to get an agreement from Cabinet that, that they're all happy. Okay, my apologies. Cabinet, um, can we take it as read that you're all happy with that unless hands are coming up okay thank you very much thank you for that reminder sorry i got distracted by coming back to bruce and agenda item late it's going very well tonight um now we come to agenda item 12 the minutes of the arts and culture forum held on the 20th of january 2022 and we have a recommendation on page 71 of the agenda which again, I'm flying down to in my micro font, right. So uh, minute two is the recommendation that Councillor Nick Hookway be appointed vice chair of the board for the remainder of the civic year and that that be passed for approval. And by board, that means the forum. Does it not, Henry, presumably? It's not some other, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, OK. And minute six, um, Culture Strategy Work Scope recommended that the Arts and Culture Forum recommend to Cabinet that the scope of work for producing the Culture Strategy evidence base, as detailed in the report, be approved. Um, so can I look for any comments from outside of Cabinet on that first, please? OK, nothing there. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet, anybody want to say anything on that? Or can we move forward uh, with your approval on that. Okay, I take that we can move that forward. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, coming to agenda item 30. The revenue and capital budgets for 2022 and 2023. So we begin with a report by Simon Davey, our S151 Chief Finance Officer, please. Thank you, Chair. So on your report, this this report follows on from the revenue and capital budget 22-23 that was presented to your last committee on the 5th of January. Um, I've put links in the report to that original uh, report that went to the January committee, the budget book and service plans, because a lot of narrative and detail around the budget uh, were included within those papers, so they're linked for you. And also details of a report that went to scrutiny regarding car parks as well. In terms of the, the draft budget that was adopted by Cabinet and then put forward to the Overview and Scrutiny Committees and Housing Review Board, um, the budget as presented was adopted in the main by those committees and the minutes of those committees are on your agenda. 
The only one exception is around proposals regarding car park charges. So there's quite a lot of debate um, by overview and scrutiny um, in terms of making recommendations on car park charges and they're presented in the report. Um, that debate um, on car park charges has been going on for some time and by me linking the scrutiny paper, I think that gives a flavour of the various discussions that have been had um, and that particularly highlights the, the busyness of our 19 prime car parks that were highlighted in that report and the proposals regarding increasing charges on those particular car parks. That debate continued um, at Overview and Scrutiny Committee with proposals coming forward to actually increase charges even further than what was originally adopted by Cabinet. Um, so in 2.3 of your report, um, I've started highlighted what was in the original budget papers regarding an increase on 19 prime car parks um, from £1.20 to £1.50. Members of overview and scrutiny committees both strongly supported further car park increase charges and they're highlighted in 2.4 of your report. Um, the recommendations were the same from both committees in terms of adopting a £2 an hour charge for, as it was termed, popular tourist hotspot car parks and they're listed in 2.4 and then to adopt the £1.50 charge for the remaining remaining car parks that were defined as category one prime car parks. As I say, within that debate, there was quite a lot of discussion around how busy those car parks were, the, the cost um, in terms of our frontline services, um, but also in terms of the financial implications, that gave um, a significant increase in our income projections and estimates. So to adopt the overview and scrutiny recommendations, that would generate to us an extra budget of 790,000 above the 339 that was originally proposed. Being prudent, as, as we are with all our budgets and being cautious, um, what I've done is factor in a 20% risk element within that. Um, a number of our income budgets, we do factor in a, a percentage reduction just for those areas that can fluctuate. So you want to be sure that the budget you set, you, you, know, you should get at least that level of return. So with a 20% reduction, that brings the income to 632,000 additional to our budget. What's important about that, as I've highlighted in 2.5, is, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll go on and say, so, with that recommendation from overview and scrutiny, officers have had a look at that recommendation and the sentiment, if you like, of what was being said in terms of increasing those car park, particular car parks to £2 an hour and looked at other car parks with the similar criteria. Um, so in 2.5, um, we've made a sort of an additional assessment on overview and scrutiny's recommendation and added a few more car parks to that list that we felt fitted into the same criteria. That would have added an additional 372,000 to the budget on top of the 632 I've mentioned. Again, if we put a risk factor on that, it brings it to 298,000. All these numbers are in your, your report in 2.4 and 2.5. Importantly then, if cabinet um, consider those two recommendations, if you like, A or B, A being um, overview of scrutiny's recommendation, or B, um, a slightly nuanced version of overview of scrutiny with a few more car parks added on. If you consider the income that that generates, um, the first option, A, following overview of scrutiny, importantly follows um, other uh, key themes from the overview of scrutiny committee, in relation to being able to afford the inclusion of staffing requests from frontline services that totaled 737,000. So if members went with the overview scrutiny recommendation, it allowed then for key staffing resources to be included in the budget of 737,000. And in section four of the, the report that's in front of you, I've highlighted what those requests were that went to the original 
uh, cabinet meeting. Also at that meeting, there was a, a strong request that within the budget, we allowed the 50,000 for the tree strategy. Um, Within option A, what's being suggested is that tree strategy is met from the carbon reduction budget. So if you take the 737 additional staff requests for frontline services, the 50,000 for the carbon reduction, that, uh, that requires us to take 89,000 from our general fund balance. Option B, if you like, to go for some additional car parks uh, within the calculation allows us to include the 737,000 for the additional staff. It allows the tree strategy to be meant to be met from its own budget, leaving the carbon reduction budget to the full figure of a third of a million, um, and gives us a, a sum of 159,000 remaining that I would recommend if that's the option you go for we ring fence to put towards the recycling and refuse costs, which if members remember in my first report, we allowed sums to allow for the increase in the contract. Um, but with 159 on top, that would definitely give us enough money to, to pay for those changes that are likely to come through. So hopefully I've explained that clearly in terms of, if you go back to the recommendations on page, on page 10, uh, sorry, page 80 and 81. The first recommendation um, in terms of this committee to council is option, the effect of option A, which is overview and scrutiny recommendations over the car parks, or option B, the, the recommendation of adding additional car parks into those two pound charges. The remaining recommendations, two, three, and four, remain the same um, no matter what the decision of car parks is. I hope that's clear, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much for that, Simon. Uh, we'll, I'll encourage as much interaction as we, as we can here and perhaps ask Mark to come in, in a bit as well, you know, as we're kind of trying to wrap this all up. Uh, so coming first to uh, non-Cabinet members, can I come to Councillor Paul Miller, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, it's rare I find myself disagreeing with the Mayor of Exmouth who put his hand, who, who's just put his hand up and will speak later. But on this issue, I, I, I do, and I've, I've come a long way. I mean, wh when we started the council term, I was against putting up the charges. But I think when you look at the, um, when you benchmark it across the other authorities in Exmouth, when you look across to Dawlish Warren, they're charging two pounds an hour, Exeter City Council's two pound 20 an hour. And then you look, you look at the stark realisation in, in this year's budget of how much we were going to have to cut and not invest in our local services. We're faced with a very difficult decision, but one I think we, we have to take. And it's, it's a decision about whether this council wants to be an austerity council or whether it wants to be a council that, that invests in its services um, for its residents. And if Exeter, Timbridge and Mid-Devon are doing that by increasing their charges, well, why aren't we? I think the most important thing that must be done alongside these um, rises, which I do agree with, um, is a £10 a month residence permit. And if there is a question I could ask, it would be to Simon or any of the, uh, uh, or Andrew Ennis, if he's in the meeting, to see what progress could be made in implementing that residence, temp uh, cheap residence affordable permit to ensure that these rises um, don't impact upon our local residents um, personally, I believe that visitors will meet this cost, and I don't think uh, I disagree with Councillor De Sarum that it will detract. It will um, lower footfall in in Exmouth, and I'm not finally just draw on the experience that's changed my view. And that sideshow, you know, being uh, having the um, ability to see from the inside as a director at Sideshore, who which have started charging two pounds an hour, seeing that there's been no negative reaction from the public. And indeed, um, its car park was completely full um, in its first year and made a significant revenue for the community interest company. So it's that experience that, that led me to, to my recommendation overview and scrutiny. I'm glad to see the officers have built on it and I look forward to Cabinet discussing the detail. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Miller. And, and genuine respect for your 
many this great road of Damascus you've trodden on this parking issue, which has actually proved to be that the amount of thought and research you put in uh, is much appreciated. It's not going to make me very popular, Chair, but thank you. <laughs> well, you know, life isn't a popularity contest, as a teacher told me at school. Um, so um, if I can just very quickly come to Mark, because he and I happen to have had a discussion this morning about this critical thing about trying to get these uh, monthly permits up and up and up and going. So, Mark, can I can I sort of come to you on that and how we might try and get something done on that? But also, just an overview from you, uh, you know, without leading the witness. I, I think it's been 10, 11 years since car park charges were increased. Um, and you go, there's your starter for 10, Mark. Yeah. Okay. In terms of the specific question around in can we introduce a monthly payment option um, there are some pra practical considerations in terms of the software that we use um, and I've discussed with Simon Simon Davies some workarounds that we might consider so I think we would certainly want to take forward uh, a commitment to um, come up with an installment option I couldn't guarantee necessarily that it would be £10 uh, a month, as Councillor Miller suggested, but I certainly think we can we can come forward with an instalment option uh, during the course of the, the early part of the new financial year. Um, in terms of the history, if you like, of our car park charging, yes, it is the case now that I think it's almost 12 years ago that we last raised our um, car park charges uh, and during that time, you know, a lot has changed, uh, not least of which has been the fact that you know, VAT is now imposed on car park charges. And um, uh, that has had a significant impact in terms of 20 percent that um, the council can benefit from in terms of, you know, providing the car parks and the other uh, aspects that, that relate to the provision of car parks. Uh, and I think then just in terms of the wider picture, um, uh, I mean, I know I don't normally give um, uh, much much out of the way of, uh, of uh, congratulations and stuff, but um, I would commend Cabinet and Council to date for the work that it's done uh, in terms of the wider picture. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes when we debate the budget, because, you know, that's the way it happens when you get a dry presentation from your Section 151 officer, we forget why we have a budget. Uh, and, you know, if you reflect on the, the council plan that we've now adopted, if you reflect on the local plan that we're currently working towards uh, and the three priorities, if you like, that the council has adopted. So better homes and communities for all, a greener East Devon and a resilient economy. The budget is the fundamental way in which we achieve that. Uh, you have had cogent evidence from service leads about the real risks of service failure in key areas. If we can't find the money to provide additional resources to uh, street seed environmental health and planning. Uh, and you also have a, a range of evidence to say that, you know, that there's no logic why we should be so behind the curve in terms of the way we approach our um, uh, charging policy for car parks compared to our neighbors. And, if anything, you know, if you were able um, collectively as a council to take this budget forward uh, into the new financial year, you will put you know, the, the council on a much better footing to achieve what it wants to achieve through its council plan uh, and other documentation, really. Thank you very much, Mark. Hugely grateful for that and for the benefit of all your experience. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll take the congratulations as well. I'll, we'll bank that one. Thank you. Um, Right, so still coming out of Cabinet, uh, Councillor Steve Gassard, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to put the record straight, start with, if I may, uh, when I attended the overview committee, um, I wasn't speaking as the Mayor of Exmouth. I was speaking as a member of overview and as an East Devon District Councillor. Um, I'm afraid I can't support the increase to two pound an hour on certain car parks. The reason I say that, and, and I know um, people would disagree with me, but that, that, that's what we're in to is a good debate. And um, 
a, a vote at the end of it. We all know where we've been over the last, well, it seems like three years and where we're still going with, with the, the pandemic. And the whole idea of trying to get people to take more staycations is to come to our wonderful resorts in, in Exmouth. I mean, that's what we're talking about, Exmouth and other parts of East Devon. And we all know what's around the corner for us. We know there's increases in national insurance. We know inflation is skyrocketing. There's going to be other issues such as increase in gas and electric prices, which is probably going to go up by 50 percent, which is going to put extra burden on to everybody. And that will mean probably that some visitors may not come on a holiday to our resorts in East Devon. And if they do, and they come down here and they find that they want to spend a nice day in Exmouth and it's two pound an hour, it may well put them off. So I, I think, and I, I, can I say, Chair, that I fully understand why car parking is used as a revenue collector for East Devon. I, I fully understand that. But I personally believe that it's the wrong time to put car parking charges up to two pound an hour in certain car parks in East Devon. Um, and I suppose somebody will say, well, when is going to be the right time? I, I don't know. Um, but I think to, to put it up from 150 to, to two pound, I think is, is too steep in this moment in time. So unfortunately, um, I wouldn't be able to sort support that view if it came to full council. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, I, I would just like to give my congratulations to uh, Councillor Miller because obviously he's done a huge amount of work on it and well done Councillor Miller. Thank you very much Councillor Gazza. A valued and respected contribution as ever, genuinely, thank you. Um, right, more trouble from Exmouth. Uh, Councillor Joe Wibley, please. I don't know what you mean, Chair. <laughs> um, I think I completely understand why this needs to be done. I, you know, balancing the budget is 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 of paramount importance. Um, and to some extent, I do agree with the two pound in um, sort of high density of use tourist car parks. Um, and I, I don't want to set a precedent where everybody comes on here and says, ah, oh, but I don't think this car park should be this amount. Um, but I do feel the need to say that the Imperial Road car park itself, so there's two in, in, in Exmouth, you have the Imperial Road car park and the Recreation Ground car park. The Recreation Ground car park, I can appreciate, is a tourist car park. Um, people go there and they do recreational activities such as, you know, um, not skydiving, uh, kite surfing, that sort of thing. Um, the Imperial Road car park is a shopping car park. Um, and I think, I, I strongly feel that that should be removed from the list of two pound um, of two pound charges, because we have two car parks in the centre of Exmouth, which are used primarily for shopping and for using um, uh, the, the the amenities of the town, not of the beach um, and the seafront area. So I ju I just like like it on record that I I strongly um, feel that that should be removed from that list, and I don't know if we're too late for that to happen, but I'd certainly like cabinet to consider that. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wibley. And we, we will certainly consider that uh, later on when it comes back into Cabinet. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor uh, Tom Wright, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I listened with interest to what Joe just said. Could I use the word Joe instead of Councillor Wibley? Is that allowed in your... In your well, no, it's, it's terrible. It's, no, I'm afraid you have to call him Councillor Wibley. It doesn't seem fair, does it? You can call him Councillor Joe Wibley, I suppose. But, I, go that, yeah. um, I don't stand on ceremony, just call me Joe. <laughs> As you know, I live in Budley Salter and I don't want to bring this down to parochialism at all, but I, I have some sympathy with what Councillor Wibley just said. I walk along our seafront regularly and I often talk to people who I see queuing to pay at our car parking pay stations. And certainly with the one here, the lime kiln one, and I don't know whether this appears applies to the other ones, people who are coming remark that how reasonable they consider the parking to be. Our sea side car parks, and 
again, this probably doesn't apply to Imperial Road. People come with, with kayaks, they come with paddle boards, they come with all sorts of paraphernalia. And to be able to park that close to a wonderful beach at that price seems not unreasonable to them. That's one side of it. The other side of the argument is, and it goes to what we spend, all these extra people who are coming provide more tasks, more problems, more challenges to our street scene oper operators who have to clear up after them. Mm. And I've always believed in the policy of the user pay. So that's what I want to say on that. Um, I note what uh, Councillor Wibley said about Imperial Road, and I have some, some sympathy with that because I know as a user of LED, or I was, um, you have to pay to park there, and that is not a that is not a seaside, that's not a visitor, that's someone coming to use some of our facilities. So I can see there's some flexibility there. But with regard to the fears, and this is where I think I'm going to be unpopular with many of my friends, that car parking charges are leading to the demise of a high street. I remember some years ago we had a that sort of observation from Sidmouth, from Sidmouth Chamber of Commerce. And I remember going to Sidmouth and finding where the Chamber of Commerce was saying business is poor, the car parks were stuffed. The difficulty wasn't not paying, it was not finding a place to park, which is certainly true of Magnolia car park in Exmouth, which is very often when I want to go to Exmouth Town Centre, I drive and park in the Imperial Road car park. I do totally support the monthly seasonal or the monthly um, offer because I think that will ease it not just for residents, but as importantly, it, it will ease the financial burden on seasonal workers. We mm. are largely still a seasonal area. And many people working our, work in our hospitality and entertainment venues for the season. Mm -hmm. So if they could come and buy just a three monthly or a two monthly ticket while they are working, for example, such as university students while they are working, I think that will go some way to ease a problem. I know I will not be popular with many, but I totally agree with what uh, the, the chief executive has said. We have not reviewed our car parking charges for many years. And in view of what my experience is of visiting our seafront at least twice a day, every day of the year, um, I totally support the recommendations of the Combined Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Wright. Your experience and perspective is hugely valued. I'm very grateful for you for making that specific point as well about the extraordinary amount of extra work uh, that street scene are having to do. I was saying in a meeting earlier, you know, in my day when we bought fish and chips, it came in a bit of old newspaper. It now comes in a kind of briefcase sized box and these bins get stuffed and we are having to do repeat collections during the summer, essentially from May to September. And that's that's causing us a huge extra cost. Thank you very much for that. So still saying outside, I think the last person I've got from outside cabinet to speak is uh, Councillor Maddie Chapman, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I would like to bring uh, Cabinet's attention to the fact that we did, uh, East Devon did do a survey, um, an independent survey on tourists and how much they spent actually um, in Exmouth, Budley, uh, Sidmouth. Um, and it was only £16 a head. So they spend the money on the car park and then sit on the beach and have a barbecue, which they bring with them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do have problems with this increase in car parks. And also as a director of Sideshore, I can understand where Councillor Miller is coming from, um, but not everyone can afford the prices of the restaurant um, at Sideshore. Um, so therefore they're not going to complain about the car park. Um, what I am getting from my residents around here is when you go to Plymouth, all the car parks are roughly the same price. When you go to Torquay, they're all roughly the same price. So why are certain car parks and four in Exmouth being targeted 
when in actual fact you could cut it down um, and charge, make the increase less and do it across the whole district. So I'm going to ask Kavner, is it not, you know, is it not in my backyard or is it will get Peter to pay but not Paul? Uh, it seems grossly unfair. Everyone's uh, expecting increase, as um, one of the other speakers said, uh, on energy, uh, on prices. Um, everyone's struggling. Everyone's struggling with their mental health. I know Councillor Armstrong um, on the Poverty Working Panel, we're, we're all working really, really hard to support people. Um, and I think to just target certain car parks I think is bad. And I think as a district council, it should be district wide um, and make it fair for all and don't let part of the district feel as if they're being penalised because they've got a beach. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Chapman. And, and I think just to, to address one aspect of what you said about not in, not in my backyard, um, it is being shared across all of the all of the uh, sea front towns. So from Seaton uh, through Beer, uh, through Budley uh, and Sidmouth, and across to Exmouth. So there is a logic to it, uh, and, and whilst we're trying very hard uh, not to make it um, more difficult uh, than it needs be for uh, towns and high streets. Um, so that there is there is a logic to that, um, but anyway, other, others will put that much better later, I suspect. And one of whom I'm very pleased to see is the relevant officer, uh, and Andrew Ennis. Uh, Andrew, would you like to come in at this point, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of things I thought might help the debate along. So forgive me. Uh, I think an important element to underline in bold is. As a cabinet, you can't simply decide you're going to put car parking charges up to raise revenue to, to spend on other things. It's simply not lawful, uh, as, as I think you know, under the Road Traffic Regulation Act. So the way we manage car parks in East Devon, we, we can use the revenue we raise, we generate for other things, of course, but we can't simply put the charges up to, to, to raise more. Uh, but having said that, for the last two or three years now, I've been talking to members, we've been working in task and finish forums and bringing reports to cabinets. And I've been pushing that there is significant headroom in the pricing policies that we've had in place. And there are certain pressures that a, that a, a, a more intelligent management strategy would, would help us to manage the car parks better. We've got some very expensive car parks to maintain. They, they certainly should cover their costs. And we've got certain car parks that are congested. Uh, I think we heard mention of the Magnolia Centre from Councillor Wright just now. Uh, others, similarly, uh, the Ham in Sidmouth particularly are the destination car park. People go and look for a space there and it's full. And people then drive around looking for spaces. Now, one of the objectives that we need to satisfy under these obligations under road traffic regulation is to reduce congestion is to improve road safety improve pedestrian safety so a, a strategy that says that the busiest heavily used car parks should perhaps see a price increase um, to, to perhaps nudge people to to alternatives including dare i say it not using their car for that journey if they can avoid it it is, is quite important. So the, the section that I've, I've been um, allowed to put into this report uh, sets out some of, some of those issues and where I think we've got to in terms of this still feeling, to me, uh, like a, a, a price increase I, I can advise members to implement. It still feels fair and reasonable if we look sideways into Dorset or into the rest of Devon. The pricing still feels fair. There, there's no evidence that fair and reasonable prices put people off going to particular destinations. They go there for a reason and providing the car parking charges are still fair and reasonable. We can take advantage of that headroom and put those prices up to, to £1.50 or £2. But the, the blanket strategy of saying let's put everything up to say £1.50 or £1.20 
because that feels fair is 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 at risk of being seen as a way of just raising revenue and you lose that intelligence base that that is is the legal bit so i'd just comment on that and perhaps leave it at that uh, for now unless anyone has any further questions well that's a really thank you so much for that andrew it's an incredibly important thing for us to be mindful of that these decisions with traffic management and car park management uh, are first and foremost about those decisions and that intelligence and how it applies to each location rather than a book balancing exercise and we do understand that i think it's it's perhaps too easy i and i understand why for some members to say oh you know putting this up to do that and why don't we just do it the same share the pain across the district it, it really isn't about that um it has to be much more canny so i'm really glad for you pointing that out to us again thank you so much um so now we come into a sea, I'm afraid, members of cabinet members, and we, we, we kick off first with Councillor Jeff Yule. Jeff, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to coin a phrase, uh, a new phrase, um, we are looking at providing more parity with our neighbouring districts, a sort of levelling up. Um, since our last price uh, rise, uh, inflation um, has gone up 35%. The last time we put the prices up was uh, 12 years ago in March um, uh, 2010. Plus, now, um, hopefully someone will correct me on this, but I understand that it was 15%. It went up 5% to 20%. Uh, so if you do the maths, 35 plus 5, um, we should be charging to be in parity uh, £1.40 at the moment. However, um, as um, Andrew Ennis uh, explained, we have to um, uh, look at the traffic issues and uh, the high peak uh, parking facilities. And we don't believe it's right for some um, inland uh, locations, uh, especially some towns which are struggling. Um, so uh, basically, you like buying a house by the seaside you, you pay for the view um on seaside resorts um you pay a little bit more however to counter the extra burden uh we want to provide a cheapest chips permit available by a monthly direct debit and i'm i'm um, i'm really pleased to hear uh, that we, we should be getting that um early um in the new year uh, financial new year that is at £120 per year, uh, uh, that is really, really cheap. Uh, as um, Councillor uh, uh, Miller mentioned, that's £10, um, uh, t £10 pounds a month. Also, we will uh, we'll not charge more than £8 for a whole day um, at any seaside town, therefore encouraging people to stay longer so that it will benefit from the uh, cafes and the nightlife, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or just hang on a few minutes and buy an ice cream. And don't forget that five months a year, we're charging two pounds uh, all day. So that's five months of the year, we're only charging two pounds. There's also the extra uh, costs attributed to running a coast, uh, coastal resort town with parks and gardens, rubbish clearance, as uh, people have mentioned. And we need to plan and improve um, all our services to maintain our resorts at the brilliant best uh, 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 facilities that we have now. Uh, so um, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Councillor Young. And thank you for the extraordinary amount of detailed work you have personally done on this. Uh, over, over recent weeks and months, uh, working with um, with Andrew and Simon in particular. So thank you for that. Uh, so we now come to our finance portfolio holder, Councillor Jack Rowland, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Young has stolen some of my thunder. Um, I think somebody uh, said earlier about we're not necessarily here to be... It, gaining popularity stakes. And I'm actually proud to be part of this administration that is grasping some of the nettles uh, that need to be grasped at the moment. And touching on that subject again, if you think about 
no increase over the last, I actually thought it was 10 years. So to hear it's 12 years is even more surprising to hear that this evening. Um, and if it has already been said, taking into account the inflation, the VAT in position over that time, then it's long overdue anyway that the, there should be an increase. And I think um, Councillor Miller mentioned the Sideshaw car park and that charges £2 an hour. I'd like to give another example as well in Sidmouth of a car park which is not run by East Devon District Council, the Bedford Lawns uh, car park, which is inevitably always full as well. And that's charging more than we're proposing anyway. So um, I think that also cements the case really about the, the laws of supply and demand. And that, to my mind, is why we need a differential between areas of the district. I think it'd be totally unfair at this stage for a variety of reasons to impose the same car parking tariff across the whole district everywhere. So I think it's right to be charging a differential rate depending on the location and the supply and demand on our car parks. So um, I'm happy as well in view of uh, what's been put into the recommendations to support uh, 1B and the 2, 3 and 4 in the recommendations of the report. Thank you very much, Councillor Rowland. So I'll accept that as a proposal from you. Uh, yes, I'm minded, of course, the last time that I can remember uh, the Conservatives putting forward an idea where everybody paid absolutely everything, no matter what the circumstances, was the poll tax. I remember that. It didn't always work out, does it? So um, thank you for that. Coming now to uh, Councillor Megan Armstrong. Megan, please. Well, thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, my original question, I've got an original question, and then I've just got a couple of comments following the recent discussion. My original question was about the the tree strategy um, amount. And I just wanted to, through you, Chair, I just wanted to ask Simon, if for any reason, um, you know, we don't get as much income, uh, we, you know, the, the finances don't work out in the general fund to include the tree strategy of 50,000 in that, would it be possible, not that I'm wanting to take anything at all from the carbon reduction fund, but would it be possible just so that we don't lose out on the tree strategy um, for that to be taken from the carbon reduction fund? As I say, it's all very hypothetical that, and I'm, I'm you know, as I say, I wouldn't want to uh, take anything away from the carbon reduction fund, but it's just a bit of a, a safety net, I suppose, really. So that if, if things don't work out as you hopefully that they will do in your recommendation, that we've got something to fall back on for the for the tree strategy, so that's that's the first thing. Sh shall I just carry on with the other yes, thing? Yes, and, and then I'll come to Simon. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's just I do have some sympathy with um, with Joe and and about the the Imperial Road car park being used for the town centre and for shoppers, and with Councillor Wright for for LED. Um, and, and I just wanted to ask if it doesn't, hopefully doesn't put Andrew on the spot too much uh, and, and, and Councillor Young. Did, what, when that, when that, the Imperial car park was considered, was it considered as a town centre car park or was it considered as a, as a tourist car park or was it a bit of both? I'm just wondering what the logic was for that. I'm sorry if I should have already known that from discussions some of us have already had, but um, I was just interested to know because I, I just have some, a few, a few doubts about it, but I just wanted some clarification really. So that's, that's all I wanted to ask. Thank Thanks, you. Megan. Okay, I'll, I'll come to Simon first and then to Andrew for you to say Simon, please. He's locked out. Well, this this excuse we've seen this a few. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I couldn't get off mute. I apologise. Um, so, within re the recommendations of the report, uh, Councillor Armstrong, option A and B both include the tree strategy. That was a very, very yeah. strong message from overview and scrutiny committees. 
Option A takes it from the carbon reduction program. Option B gives us enough funding to allow it to be funded by itself. Yeah. So it leaves the carbon reduction budget alone, if you like. Yeah, That's I was it. I was sorry, I was thinking of sorry, through the chair. I was thinking of, of option B, but just in case that went pesh <laughs> for any reason, <laughs> we didn't have enough money, would we be able to revert part to pay for that through the carbon reduction fund? I, I'm I'm looking for Marianne's face. I'm not wanting to take anything away from your budget, Marianne, really. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's in either option. So whichever, whichever the recommendation goes forward, subject to it being one of those recommendations, it will be within a budget, Megan. Yeah, yes. Sorry to confuse it. I don't, didn't mean to confuse it at all, but I just wanted to be reassured, I suppose, that that money is oh, going to be... It's a, it's a good hypothetical, Megan, so, th so yeah. thank you. Um, yeah. So, and Andrew, please, th thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to respond to that last point that uh, Councillor Armstrong made. Uh, for sure, it is not an exact science, the exercise we've been through. You know, there is no yeah. such thing as a purely tourist car park. There's also an element of what I said earlier about the busiest and the highest churn car parks where they're, they're exceptionally busy. Uh, that's another reason why we might want to put the, the prices up. So, yeah, Imperial Road kind of ticked the boxes in in all of those categories. I, I'm aware it's used by local people as well, but that's why I really want to promote and push the uh, the permits. I would hope mm, most yeah. local people who go into town more than once a week will see that two or three pounds a week for a permit is a far better deal. Yes. Than yeah. they go. So I really want to promote that. And I, I'm reasonably confident that we're going to get over the line with the 10 pounds monthly payment for, for people who have just used the one town. Um, I've, I've, I might have to resort to pay by phone options. Our pay by phone supplier Ringo's is more advanced, has a lot more flexibility in how they um, process transactions and they're, they're much more agile in terms of bringing permits live and making them not live when people don't pay. And that's one of the practical issues we have with our more traditional permit sales systems at the moment but we'll get something over the line i'm sure it might not be a fully comprehensive system but customers will have the option to pay by phone uh at 10 pounds a month if nothing else yeah thank you Andrew, Thanks. very much and thank you councillor armstrong as well that's that's great thank you and as the ceo said you know obviously an absolute priority for the council to get these permits up and running ship shape and bristol fashion you know early in the financial year because if we're going to do this we you know we, that's a promise we're making alongside it we have we have to deliver that is crucial so thank you so coming next please to uh councillor dan ledger dan please thanks very much chair um it's just quite heartening to see that we've we've got a comprehensive strategy now that's done through the, the meticulous work of uh, Simon Davey, uh, Andrew Ennis and, and Jeff Young's obviously put a lot of time into this. Um, and it's that's the, the point that I'm really encouraged with, that that's leading to us formulating uh, these policy decisions that's had a full airing from Cabinet to overview back to Cabinet. It's gone all around the houses and it's I feel like it's had a full airing uh, and we've come to a, a good conclusion. I think... There's a lot of the debate previously has focused on what the, the daily charges are for, for Joe Public, but I don't think we've really um, we've focused on the permits enough. And one of the amendments that I would like to make is, and I'm sure it will be already been trained, would be for um, Councillor Young to work with Councillor Jackson um, and Andrew Hopkins to, to really push forward a campaign to our residents um, pushing these permits. If you look at the permits, they're what, if you use it uh, just weekends only, it's £1.17 a day. If you use it for your working week, you're looking at 46p a day. Uh, and then if you use it every day it, and you're using it to for, as, a, as a car park for your house, as additional parking, that's 32p. Now that's incredible for, for car parks for across the district. And that's what we need to be pushing rather than looking at it parochially over two pound a day but, and it's going to drive away businesses, it's, it's not. We need to focus on getting our residents onto these permits 
So then they can still feed into the town centres. We've got the, the policy in place already looking at the differentiation between um, the beaches and, and the town centres in itself. Um, we just need to go that one step further and really communicate to all our residents that the permits are here for you to use, utilise them as best as possible um, and, and give, make it as easy as possible to, to access it. So thanks very much uh, and thanks everyone for their work. Thank you, Councillor Ledger. If you can just think um, of uh, just one line that might be added to either options A or B, uh, just while we're considering that, I think that no, might I'll be in the chat. using your clerking knowledge. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Maria, oh no, sorry, my great apologies. Councillor Jeff Pook is there. Councillor Jeff Pook, please. Sorry, I apologise. I didn't know I had my hand up, so I wasn't looking to speak. So, oh, well, that's okay. I, no. It keeps <laughs> on going. It's, it's gone up again. And oh, no, I it think it's going to, to the camera sometimes. Oh, okay, no, apologies. No, no that's okay. No, I, have all, I, I do thumbs up at random moments, which is very embarrassing. It's nothing to do with me. So, very good. Uh, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, Councillor Marianne Rickson, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased that Dan made those comments because I, I do agree with what he's been saying. Um, and I also um, am heartened to hear that Andrew says we may be able to use a phone app as an option for payment. Um, with regard to Sidmouth, I'm going to be a bit parochial here, but I would just like to mention that um, other areas we have been looking at the shopping option and uh, Roxburgh is really the, the, um, the little car park that a lot of us use for, sh for, for shopping. And um, I think the rate there is going to be £1.50 instead of £2 per hour. I don't know whether it also needs to be short stay for two hours to, to make this a uh, better turnover. Uh, I, I don't, I'll depend on what committee feel. Um, but I also am very much in favour of us checking to be sure that anyone who wants a permit is a bona fide resident who pays council tax. No one who evades paying tax should be allowed to have a permit, in my view, because this is absolutely unfair to those who do pay their council tax. Um, I think other than that, well, apart from the other comment that Jack made was about he feels there should be a differential. And in fact, that even somewhere as small as the Sid Valley, you'll find car park usage, chock a block down at the seafront, Sid Ford, mm, half empty probably. So, you know, there, there is a, a differential, even in just a, a mile and a half, a mile and a quarter, whatever it is. Anyway, those are my comments. Thank you very much, Councillor Rickson, very much indeed. Okay, so we are, we continue in cabinet then. Councillor John Loudon, please. Oh. I'm terribly sorry, John. I have done this to you once before. Uh, Andrew's, Andrew Ennis's hand is up. So do you mind if I come to Andrew first? <laughs> if you just freeze there. Thanks, John. Uh, Andrew, please. Just very quickly, Chair. Councillor Wixom said that Roxburgh is on the list at £1.50. There is an option in, on your list at Roxburgh going to £2 as well. The reason I've suggested that is I, I think if you had one cheap car park and others more expensive, you'd have a, a further congestion and queuing problem. Um, it didn't make sense. So I've suggested if we're going to go to two pounds in those Sidmouth centre car parks, it should be all or nothing. Um, nothing else would make sense. But again, residents could take advantage of the permits. Okay, thank you for that, Andrew, very much. Right now, Councillor John Loudon, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I think this is, uh, I think I'm very, a bit like Councillor Ledger, I'm, I'm quite heartened by uh, the discussion that's taken place, particularly of recent times. And obviously, you know, uh, as others have said, you know, we are where we are tonight because of the uh, support and, and work of the officers and um, the portfolio holder, Jeff Young, as well as uh, colleagues on overview and scrutiny. And I listened to their discussions um, with interest. So that was incredibly useful and appropriate because we've been kicking this, you know, this, this current um, uh, um, group of 60 members, we've kicked this around now for what, 
two and a half years or so, and, and we've avoided it. It's been kicked down the can and, and it really has, has not um, gone anywhere in any shape until of late, uh, frankly. Having said that, I don't think there's any of us uh, in this chamber tonight, across, across this meeting tonight, who want to put up any of the charges. I don't think we're doing this um, for uh, out of malice or just because we think we ought to do it. We're doing it because it is the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to do because there is broad uh, support across uh, uh, the membership to do so. And it is the right thing because we've talked about for the last, what, 10, 11 years, uh, the car parking charges have been at a pound an hour. Uh, I've done the inflation calculator for this evening. A pound 10, 11 years ago is worth, should be pound forty today. So we should have been at pound forty today, in my view, just to keep uh, it with inflation. That means cumulative each year, we have lost the income at an inflationary rate. So it's not just the short term uh, income, it is the impact upon our longer term finances. Our costs associated with maintaining car parks will have gone up over the last 10, 11 years. Sure as heck, uh, those haven't stayed uh, at uh, no increase, no, no inflationary rate. So we are, we are subsidising the contractors, etc., cetera, um, by not having put it up. So this matter has been, in my view, ducked and avoided over the last decade. And we've got to the point now where we can't just keep doing so. And as Jack was talking about earlier on, I'm proud that we are taking this and trying to deal with it. It's important. Uh, and there's never a good time to put up, up any prices. Everybody knows that. It's never popular. But I didn't come into, into being a councillor to be popular. I came in it to, to do the right thing. And I think we have to do the right thing today. If you... We've been told that if we increase our car parks, we're going to price ourselves out of the market. We're going to make the town centres suffer. We're going to drive the tourists away. No, I disagree with that. And uh, if you look at that, that's a screenshot of the Bedford Lawn car park that's been talked about in Sidmouth. It's down there, slap bang in the middle of the town. All right, it's not quite as near as the ham, but it's as near as heck to it. It is two pounds an hour for the first hour. It has got a maximum in the day of eight pounds. What did Councillor Young talk about earlier on? He talked about a commitment that we would have a maximum charge of eight pounds in the day. So Bedford Lawn, is it empty? Is it heck? It is always every day, every season busy. And there are queues in to get into it and it creates chaos around the front of Sidmouth. It is busy, it is popular. Therefore, that is demonstrated that they are not pricing themselves out of the market. And I think for all of those reasons, we have to take this and move it forward in the way that Councillor Young is now proposing. And I concur with uh, previous councillors that we should be adopting 1B as well as uh, the recommendations two, three, and four. And let's see ourselves in April in a much better position, not just for our car parks, but across our broader uh, budgets so that we can support, maintain, and develop this council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Loudon. And of course, the beneficiaries of this, if this decision is taken, are the council services. Um, and there'll be an election in a year and a bit's time. And we will have to justify these raises at that point. And if 
for sake of argument, another political party gets in at that time and takes over the administration, who, who knows what will happen, then they will have the benefit of this, that what we have done is grasp the very serious medium-term financial implications around these issues as well. And it can't be ducked anymore. This is this is in the public interest, and I, I have no doubt about that. Um, coming, please, now to uh, oh, one more uh, special treat from outside of Cabinet, but not too long, please, Councillor Joe Whibley. OK, this is brief as I can. Could I just say that um, where um, Andrew Ennis spoke about there being a price differential in car parks in Sidmouth, uh, leading to large queues at one and no traffic at the other. Um, the Imperial Road situation in Exmouth will lead to exactly the same thing. They're very, very close together. Everybody will be looking to get in that one because it's cheaper. Um, so I think that really, really needs to be considered. Um, and I would request that if you, if, if it's too difficult to make a decision on that tonight, that at, at the very, very least that be considered and this bit slotted in at a later date or something, because I, I think you're going to cause massive traffic disruption in the town, potentially. Thank you. I hope that was short. OK, that's great. Thank you, Councillor Wibley. Um, uh, right, Councillor Paul Hayward, please, Deputy Leader of the Council. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you to the previous speakers uh, from inside and outside Cabinet. Um, really, I, I, I'm delighted that everything I was going to say has been said, uh, other than two things I'd just like to throw in. Um, like a great many of us here, uh, I'm a parent, I've travelled with my children on holiday and as a tourist, and, you know, I, I've never yet not parked in a car park in a tourist spot that I want to go to because of the cost of the parking. It's just, you just go. That's part of your day out is parking. You go where you want to go. Um, I take Councillor Chapman's point that there's a, an aggregate spend um, and we want to encourage tourism. Uh, but we also have a duty as a council to cover the things that uh, uh, Councillor Rickson and, and Mr Ennis has covered. We have obligations in terms of encouraging people to not use their cars. It's a, it's a far wider issue. But you know, the nub of what's been said and, and very eloquently by Councillor Loudon really can't be improved upon. I'd just like to, if I may, thank Councillor uh, Tom Wright for his suggestion earlier uh, about seasonal um, permits and I think that's something we could explore because a monthly permit as Councillor Ledra says is exceptionally good value we should push that message over and over and over again because the maths simply it's incontrovertible I have a permit even though councillors have some you know some other uh, benefits uh, I have a permit I pay for a permit and it's great value um, but we need to push that message but a seasonal permit for those workers who come to our uh, tourist locations and work seasonally, I think would be a very, very, uh, something with a lot of merit. And I'd like that to see that explored, but we can delegate that to um, Councillor Young and the officers, I'm sure. But like everyone, I'm, I'm proud to be part of the administration that has grabbed this, understands the profound need to do it. Um, and that yes, others may get the benefit. Well, that's one of those things, you know, we're here to do the right thing not to be populists. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Haywood, for that. Um, so coming back to Andrew, Andrew Ennis, please. Sorry to come back again, Chair. I thought it was just worth saying what, what you've got in front of you moment with car parks isn't the complete picture. We've got some unfinished business in various areas, and I'm not trying to tackle it all today. Uh, a review of all of the permits on offer, I think, is a really good call. I'd like to work with members to, to see what we should be offering and who should be entitled to what. I think that's a really good point. Uh, equally, we've got a number of car parks not on the list today where there's a different tariff or in some cases no tariff at all. I think we've got to tackle that as a council. Um, we, we've got to look at reserve parking policies as well. Uh, some people pay an awful lot of money for the reserve space. And we've absolutely got to tackle the motorhomes and caravans strategy, which someone alluded to earlier. Forgive me, I can't remember who it was. But so they're all on the list. I think we need to come back to those at, a, at another forum, but not, not for today. Thank you, Andrew. A a absolutely. Uh, it, it would have been tempting to try and roll all this into to today's meeting, but it would have been just too much. So those things must stay stay on our agenda. I mean, I think at this moment, what I'd want to do as well is, is to thank the, those members, many members who made a full contribution to the car parking TAF over a couple of years um, for, for a 
dozen different reasons, it, it came hard for that to come to firm conclusions. And, and so it's why this has come back into cabinet really to try and you know lead lead on, on, on this moving forward. It's just so complex. Um, so coming to Councillor Sarah Jackson, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points. Um, firstly, um, thank you to Councillor Ledger. Um, completely uh, support his his amendment there. I have had some discussions um, uh, with our uh, communications team and Andrew Hopkins um, around uh, promoting the existing passes. Um, and I think that's something that we do need to do in advance of any uh, monthly payment options, which is what's I think being proposed in, in both a sort of seasonal capacity or, or a monthly rolling uh, charge here. Um, and because the existing passes, which are annual passes and paid annually, they offer incredible value. Um, and so having had conversations with a lot of residents um, around car parking, I'm, I'm I'm not surprised, um, but um, there's an awful lot of people that are not aware that that's available to them. Um, and I think the more we can do to make residents more aware that they can make huge savings by operating in that way, the better. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Um, and I think I think we can continue to do that. Uh, and then when monthly payment options come forward, we can then start promoting those too. Um, I will say that I do agree with uh, Councillor Hayward in terms of um, how uh, parking uh, fees affect tourism. Um, I have to say, I've never chosen the place that I holiday uh, in the UK, and I've holidayed in the UK in a lot of different places based on what the parking fees in that area are. It's never even crossed my mind. I'm more worried about the outlay for my, my accommodation and my travel. Um, and ultimately, I think that when people go to a destination, um, whilst there is that that spend, that price per head that people spend in that location, uh, it, it's relatively low. And I think that's largely because people go, they park up, they spend their day on the beach, they pay the fee that their parking costs, then they spend some money on lunch and then they might buy an ice cream. And I don't think that spending money on lunch and buying an ice cream is going to really change as a result of increased fees in the car park because that's just a cost that people um, are prepared to pay when they're on holiday. Um, but we do need to make sure we're supporting residents, local businesses, uh, workers, and I think that's where those passes does come in. Um, so it, it's, it's never gonna be popular um, putting up any parking fees, but we have to recognise that with the increases in tourism to our areas, it's putting our, our services under a lot more pressure just to maintain the existing uh, facilities that we have because there's a lot higher footfall. And so that needs to wash its own face in some way um, so that we can continue to provide that provision. So unfortunately, as, as uncomfortable as it is to do, I think we need to, it's been too long without a revision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Jackson. Uh, so two more speakers on this, just coming back outside of Cabinet and please to bring Councillor Tom Wright back in, please, uh, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just a, a silly thing that there are a number of, or two or three elderly people in Budley, you wouldn't believe it, who aren't online. And in fact, as, as, as Andrew Ennis will know, I act, they actually bring me their reminders for their renewal and I do it all online for them. I'm just wondering through Sarah, when they look into this, if they can look at actually doing something to help those people who can still fill in a direct debit form by post and send it off. I know it's a small thing, but if we want to push the, uh, the use of permits, which could lead to a, an income drop, but if we want to push the, uh, in, push the permits, we do need to ensure that all of our residents are able to make themselves or are able to use that facility. That's all I want to say, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor. I'm sure that's noted by uh, by Sarah and Andrew and Simon. 
uh, and everybody else concerned on this, uh, or both Andrews, I should say. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, just coming then to uh, round up, really, if we can, to uh, Councillor Jeff Young. <laughs> He's comic that I've got Councillor Poop with his hand up again, but I'm guessing it's another, uh, it's a rogue hand, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Okay, so, Councillor Jeff, it's York. a real hand this time. Oh, it's a real. Oh man, this is. Oh, this is oh, I'll never play Very poker with you, one. Jeff. I'm so confused. Okay, over to Councillor Pook then, please. And that's my my thumbs up. Does keep going. Whether I'm using a mouse, it goes up for some other things. I don't know. But you know, I think beer is one of the places which is affected as much as any, but perhaps not more because we've got three car parks all going up to the two pounds. But um, and perhaps people in beer might be thinking I should be arguing that it should be going down, but. No, I think, you know, the, the, uh, having a differential rate for the seaside is correct. Um, I don't think it'll um, impact on the holiday numbers, as people have said. It's, a, it's just a 50p growl or um, what's that, three pound, um, four pounds a day. It's not going to make that impact. And we do need the money for the other services. So since my hand keeps on going up automatically, it must mean I want to speak anyway. So <laughs> I do support you on this. Thank you. It was meant to be. Thank you very much, Councillor Poot. OK, so finally to Councillor Jeff York, please. Yeah, just a couple of points on, uh, on the Exmouth issue. Um, we have to look at the Imperial Road and Imperial Road Recreation Ground and Camperdown Terrace as a job lot. Um, if you um, increase the price in one, you have to increase the price in all, or if you decrease the price in one, you have to decrease in all. And um, it was a difficult one, to, it's a iffy one certainly, but I, I would support the, 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 um, keeping it two pounds. Uh, bearing in mind the permits, bearing in mind that LED also offer uh, car park permits uh, that are, are less than um, the, the, the standard offer, um, specifically for um, the LED at Exmouth. Um, the, the other issue, I, I can't understand um, why people are saying that just because everyone else has put their prices up from the gas suppliers to the candlestick maker, we can't put our prices up. Um, the, the headline is that we have held our prices for 12 years. And now that that is the headline, isn't it? Now, we, we have held the prices for 12 years and unfortunately... We, we are now having to put the price up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Young. So I suppose in, in summarising, I've said this already, but it's worth saying again, thank you to all the members who have been involved uh, in this process all the way through, um, particularly latterly, obviously to Overview and Scrutiny, who gave this a great deal of cross-party thought. Thank you for that. Thank you to our officers who have given a huge deal of thought and, and of course have commended this to us today. Um, we have a proposal from Councillor Rowland which is that we uh, go for option 1b in the recommendations together with uh, recommendation number two that council tax is approved uh, five pounds a year giving a bandy council tax of 156 pounds 78 for 2022-23. Uh, the third recommendation that the housing revenue account estimates with a net surplus of uh, 208,000 is approved. And four, that the net capital budget totaling 7.919 million for 2022-23 is approved. Um, Councillor Ledger, did you want to add a line to option B? If that's councillor uh, uh, in relation to the um, the media, Can yeah. If it's, if it's okay with uh, councillor Roland as proposer, the, just the amendment that I've added to the chat is uh, for our communications manager to work in consultation with our portfolio holder for the environment and our portfolio holder for democracy and transparency to build a campaign promoting car park permits available to our residents. Is it okay for you, Jack, Councillor Rowland? More than happy to accept that, yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then asking Henry, can we bolt that on to the end of 1B then? Is that okay? You know, I was just going to say recommendation five. I don't, I don't think it needs to bolt to 1B. Okay, so that becomes recommendation five. In which... If you haven't got it, I'll be the seconder. 
I'm literally going to ask you that. Your young reflexes are even faster than mine. So let us then uh, please go right. to... Just, I appreciate it. It's very late in the day. You've asked me reminded of the fact of the minutes of OS, ONS and, and HRB to, and we'll reflect that they're taken into account with, if that's what you wish. It seems fairly self-evident to me given the report that that would have been the case anyway. Okay, so how do we actually deal with that technically, Henry? We'll, we'll, just, note, we'll just note it in the minutes that they were taken into account. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Right. Amanda, can you take us to a vote on this then, please? Yes, Chair. Um, councillors, if you can vote in the usual way, please. Green ticks in favour, red crosses if you're against. That's unanimous, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda, and thank you to everybody for your contributions to that particular item. Um, I'm wondering when we should take a break because we are approaching half time. Um, there's a fair bit still to go. We're going to have to have a break in about 15 minutes. Councillor Hayward, what do you think? Take it now or do one more item? Um, I don't think it makes any difference. This seems a natural... Uh, well, my colleagues seem to be saying one more item. Uh, Chair, oh, oh, you're, you're in charge. Okay. It's All a natural right. pause, but we can do another one. If, if, if I was any kind of leader, I'd now ignore everybody and savagely demand an instant break. But let's do one, let's do one more. So uh, that is going to be agenda item 14 from memory. Uh, as I scroll back up, uh, thank you. Right, agenda item 14 is our capital strategy for 2022-23 until 2025-26. Um, we have a report here, I believe, from our finance manager, John Sines. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll look to be quick. Um, yeah, so the 22-23 capital strategy comes to you as part of the annual budget process. Um, it's pulling together various uh, strategies and processes um, covering capital expenditure um, and treasury management. The two are very closely linked. Um, the 22-23 strategy has been reviewed um, and it is in line with previous strategies. Um, but we are going to be looking to review it within the financial year. Um, in late December, SIPFA published uh, revised treasury management and potential codes. Um, and they don't have to be formally adopted um, now. Um, they have to be adopted in 23-24, but we are required to have regard to those new codes. Um, so in order to, to take that on board, um, once we've received a bit more guidance, a bit more training around those codes, um, we are gonna aim to get the report back to you as part of the mid-year report. Um, on the updates um, and requests um, adoption of that revised uh, strategy at that point. Um, that's all I was going to cover. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, John. Uh, can I ask if there are any uh, questions uh, or comments from outside of Cabinet, please, by raising your yellow hand? I don't see anybody there. Okay, can I come back into Cabinet, please? Perhaps looking for a proposer. Councillor Jack Rowland. Thank you. Um, and thank you, John, for your, for your report. Um, in view of the information that's uh, contained in there, which I think is self-explanatory, I'm happy to move the recommendation as shown on page... 80, can't remember, 89 of the agenda. Do you want me to read it out or are you happy to do that yourself? <laughs> um, uh, go on, read it out. It's only a short one. Okay. In order to comply with good practice, there is a requirement for the council to have in place an adopted capital strategy. So the recommendation is that Cabinet recommends the council the adoption of the capital strategy 2022 to 23 to 2025-26. Brilliant. Okay, can we look for a seconder for that as well, please? Seconded. I've got my hand up. Thank you, Marianne. 
Uh, Amanda, can you take us to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Members, if you can vote in the usual way, green ticks and support, red crosses if you're against, and your electronic hands up if you're abstaining. That's unanimous in favour of the recommendation, Chair. OK, well, that went a lot quicker than I thought. And on the basis that we might be able to allow uh, John to go home, let's see how... Well, can we go to agenda item 15 uh, and see if we can... Well, you know, with due, you know, less, less speed, more haste, or the other way around. Um, John, can we come to you then still for agenda item 15, which is the Treasury Management Strategy 2022-23, minimum revenue provision policy statement and annual investment strategy. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, again, like the capital strategy, um, the Treasury management strategy has been reviewed um, and updated for the coming year. Um, the, the document is long, it's very prescribed, it's very technical in areas, um, and we do, we do get support um, in this area from our Treasury advisors. Um, there's, there's two sort of main elements to the to the strategy. The first being uh, the operation and control of cash flow. Um, so making sure we've got available money at the right time. Um, and also it's around setting the parameters in which we can sort of deposit that money and with who, for how long, et cetera. Uh, the second element of it is around uh, the, the management of the funding of the council's capital expenditure. Um, and part of that is the MRP policy um, as presented. Um, again, we, just the same as the capital strategy, uh, we're also intending on reviewing this one, this document in the year because of the revised codes that were published in late December. Um, the areas that we will be considering um, in that revised code is detailed on page three of the strategy. Um, so yes, uh, that, that was everything. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John, very much. Uh, do we have any uh, questions or comments from outside of Cabinet, please? If not, uh, can I come to Councillor Dan Ledger in Cabinet, please? Thanks, Chair. Keep it quick. Can I propose, as stated in the report, A, B and C, please? Thank you. Councillor Paul Haywood, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to second that. Uh, I just really, it's just an observation. Thank John for his uh, report. Um, <clears throat> within 2.1, uh, which is on page 111, you'll see a section at the bottom um, for local government employers revised pay offer for 21-22. And it's just an observation um, from my own experience that, you know, a 1.75% not agreed figure is £190,000. Well, we all know that inflation is running far higher than that. Um, and the unions that represent local government employees are, have argued for higher. So you can see how tiny percentages actually create huge financial headaches. Uh, and so I'm very grateful to John for outlining all of this. It's very complex, but yes, yes, Chair, happy to second and uh, move this on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Haywood. And I endorse every word you've said there. Um, so we have a proposer and a second, and nobody else wants to speak. Oh, or do they? I don't, well, well, no, that's no, a rogue tick still lingering. So, uh, Amanda, can you take us to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Councillors, if you can vote in the usual way. Green ticks, red crosses. That's unanimous in favour, Chair. Thank you, um, Amanda. And well, come on, let's uh, let's try and do one more. We've still got eleven minutes before eight o'clock. So, uh, John, if you can take us through the financial monitoring report, twenty twenty one twenty two, month ninth of December, uh, month nine, <laughs> December twenty twenty one. Uh, thank you again, Chair. Um, yes, so the finance team undertook this budget monitoring round uh, in early January uh, with the help of uh, budget holders um, to forecast estimate, uh, estimated outturns um, for the year. Um, many of the cost pressures that that actually raised um, have actually previously been um, identified 
Um, and listed in the report is the funding of those pressures uh, from the government funding that we've received. Um, so yes, they're all detailed within the report. Um, overall, the month nine budget monitoring report is very much in line with month six, which was reported back in November. Um, although there is an adverse position on the general fund, um, it has slightly improved since the last report, um, but the general fund balance will remain within the adopted range. Um, moving on to the housing revenue account position, it's predicted again to be in a favourable position. Um, if this is ma maintained, uh, this will this will be reserved, and the housing review board will have the opportunity to allocate that money. Uh, the final two sections of the report cover capital and the treasury management positions um, at December. Um, happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you very much, John. Again, uh, so the recommendation there is that the variance is identified as part of the revenue and capital monitoring process up to month nine be acknowledged. Uh, can I look for any speakers from outside of Cabinet first, please? Um, no, thank you. In which case, can I come to Councillor Paul Haywood, please? Thank you, Chair. My apologies. My previous statement uh, was a little bit premature um, because it actually related to this item. I'm yes. sort of using a laptop without a mouse and it's uh, my big chunky fingers are scrolling all over the place. <laughs> so I'm happy on this. Uh, thank you again, John. Uh, I'm happy to propose that recommendation um, and seek a seconder. Um, obviously, my earlier comments apply to this, not to the previous. Apologies to that member. <laughs> uh, but, um, but yes, thank you, Chair. Happy to propose. That's great. I have a terrible fear that nobody noticed that, Paul, but I don't know. I, I, I'll be interested to email some people later. Yeah, I did. Um, and uh, so can I come to Councillor Jack Rowland, please? Thank you. I was going to spare Councillor Hayward's blushes, actually. So thank you for the confession. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm happy to uh, second the, uh, the uh, recommendation. OK, thank you very much. Amanda, can you take us to the vote then, please? Yes, Chair. Councillors, if you can vote in the usual way, please. That's unanimous in favour, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Thank you, John, for a record-breaking hat-trick there, I think. Um, and can we now take a break until 8 o'clock, if that's OK with members? 8 o'clock, please. Thank you.
Okay, Chair, are you happy to continue? I am, Amanda. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, over to you then. Thank you very much, everybody. Screens on, children, if you're there. I'll give you 30 seconds and then for those of you still dashing back into the room. Very good. Cabinet, where are you? Lovely. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we now come to agenda item 18 um, with apologies to Andy and indeed Rob in a minute to whom this always happens where they come at the end of meetings uh, or, or, or well down the agenda but um, it's great to have a fresh start here because we want to hear what Andy has to say on the clean growth vision for development in the west of the district um, and we have a report from Andy Wood our service lead for growth development and prosperity. Okay, Chair, do you want to start with the item 17, the ARG report? That's the one before Andy's. Well, that's a very, <laughs> that's a very good idea. It's a very good, I, was, I was looking at Andy's face and thinking, just, I've never seen terror like that on anybody. So, right, in which case, Rob, thank you very much. Agenda item 17, additional restrictions grant, also known as the ARG, for the period 30th of December 2021 to the 31st of March this year, uh, a report from our Economic Development Manager, Rob Murray. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the report puts forward our proposals to mobilise a new round of additional restrictions grant funding, or ARG, to support local businesses who've been advers adversely affected by the increased number of COVID-19 infections. Predominantly, this covers the emergence of the Omicron variant. Um, the Chancellor announced this further round of ARG top-up funding on December the 21st. We can confirm now that Bayes, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy have now transferred princely sum of £277,681 to East Devon District Council, along with 21 pages of updated guidance and specific terms and conditions as to how this is to be administered um, via uh, an entirely new application process. Uh, the report invites members to endorse the ARG for policy set out in Appendix B um, and developed uh, in adherence very much with the Bayes guidance to guide the deployment uh, together with the operational and decision making arrangements as set out. These are very similar to um, the previous ARG 3 scheme. Uh, for information, we've been deploying, uh, sorry, developing our new online application and assessment process over recent weeks and subject to approval today, uh, we're on track to launch the scheme early next week. One thing I think we should flag um, that's relevant to this report, section 3.2 of the report notes the likelihood of postponement to the delivery of our Innovation and Resilience Fund programme. This is to allow staff to focus on delivery of the ARG4. Um, to update, it's now very clear that there isn't any wider staff resource that we can call on to deliver both grant schemes simultaneously. And as such, we've got, um, because we've got just eight weeks to achieve full grant spend of the ARG4, or else we hand the money back to government, I think we will now be required to temporarily pause our processing and panel reporting of the IRF programme until April. Um, will therefore extend via delegated authority from September Cabinet the current deadline for full bid IRF submissions from the 4th of March to the 1st of April, at which date we'll immediately return to IRF assessment and resume the panel meetings to also complete full spend of that very successful recovery focused programme. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Rob, for that report and that excellent um, uh, praise of it as well. Uh, can I look now, please, for anybody from outside of Cabinet who would like to speak? If not, please, I'll come to Councillor Paul Hay. Thank you, Chair. Um, very simply, I'd like to move the recommendations as proposed here. Um, thank uh, Rob and Tom and Andy and Libby and everyone who's working on this. Um, the amount of money involved, yes, it's 277,000. You know, it's not to be sneezed at and it will help a great many people. But in the scheme of what we as a council have already given out in these in the ARG schemes and others, it, it's less than 1%. And the inordinate amount of work, and you've heard there about the new base guidance and a new way of doing it, 
it's completely disproportionate to the, actually, in some ways, the benefit. And it, what it's done is it's taken our focus, uh, a very intensive focus um, of a panel, which is doing great work cross party, across members of this council to help and innovate and, 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 and adapt <clears throat> and help businesses achieve more in East Devon. And it is a pity that we've had to pause it simply because of resourcing issues. So as the portfolio holder and the cabinet member for economy, on behalf of East Devon, I'd just like to use this platform to apologise to all those people who have gone to the effort of putting in applications to IRF. Their applications are not in vain. Uh, they will be considered, but it just has to be paused while we do this. That's uh, It's an inconvenient truth. So uh, we, rest assured, we will get to them, we will consider them, and the panel will look at each one, and we'll rely on officers to give us guidance. But that's where we are, Chair. Um, so I'm happy to propose these recommendations and would seek a second. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hayward. For that, Councillor Marianne Rickson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm happy to uh, second this. Uh, just a point of clarification, though. Um, as the IR office being um, suspended, and I'm on that committee, I'm assuming that I'm not going to be on the ARG committee, in which case I'd need to make a declaration. I'm assuming that it will be the original committee on the ARG. I'm not involved, but I'm not sure. Yeah, Rob, what do you think? I think the proposal as it stands is that the current IRF panel become the ARG4 panel. In truth, it's, it's always dealt with discretionary grant spend. So it's always been the discretionary grants panel, really. Well, um, in, in that case, just to, just to be clear, I, I need to just declare that I'm on that panel as well, just for the, the record. Sure. Thank you. OK, thank you. Right. That's very clear. Um, and you maybe get a new T-shirt, Marianne, as well, with a different uh, Team ARG for this process. Um, right. Very good. In which case, no further speakers. We have a proposal and a seconder. Amanda, can we go to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Councillors, if you could vote in the usual way, please. That's unanimous in favour of the recommendations, Chair. Thank you very much, Amanda, and thank you, Rob, for that. Uh, again, uh, apologies for keeping you waiting so long. Now, uh, having uh, heralded onto the stage once already, <laughs> let me attempt it again. Andy Wood for Agenda Item 18, the Clean Growth Vision for Development in the Western District. And Andy is our service lead for Growth, Development and Prosperity. Over to you, please, Andy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, evening, members. Um, so this report has previously been considered by Strategic Planning Committee and also by Devon County Council's Cabinet. Um, with, uh, so, and there is one addition which I'll come back to at the end. Uh, so just to introduce this in terms of context, um, the essence of clean growth is to decouple economic growth from carbon emissions. Um, the UK has had some success with that over the past decade or more. Um, there was a, a national strategy for clean growth published in 2017. Uh, which was badged as a blueprint for our low carbon future. That was followed in 2020 by the 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution. Uh, and most recently by um, the national strategy for or net zero strategy published in October of last year in, in the run up to COP26. Um, so there's a real um, and concerted direction of travel uh, around getting to a, a net zero economy. Uh, and that is bolstered locally, for example, the Harvard Southwest level um, at a, a locality as well, in terms of a blueprint that's been published for clean growth at that level as well. Um, so the prompt for this work was really around the airport, I, I suppose, ironically, in some ways. Um, if you imagine, if you remember two years ago, um, Flybe were um, close to going into administration. Uh, then the impact of the pandemic. Um, at one point, no, I think there was a very significant risk that that would represent an existential threat to the operation of the airport. Uh, and that was in conjunction with, um, if you like, a global challenge for the aviation industry to decarbonise as well. Um, jump forward um, uh, to last summer, um, and we saw the trial of the first electric hybrid or hybrid electric flight uh, from the airport. Um, and that potentially heralds uh, a wider role, and a more significant role, if you like, for the airport as a testbed for sustainable aviation going forward. So you'll see in the work uh, that sustainable aviation, or in the re report that sustainable aviation is picked up as one of four opportunities alongside greener buildings, um, greener finance uh, and smart grids. Uh, and it, 
that, that really pulls together um, what our locality or the west of the district could do to really move towards clean growth. Uh, and if you think about uh, how that might sit within the local plan, by 2040, for example, um, there will be no diesel-powered HGVs on sale. Um, alternative sources of power, such as hydrogen, will need to come to the fore by that point. So that's all things we need to be planning for in the context of the local plan moving forward. The core of the documents are set out in paragraph 3.2, um, includes the vision, uh, eight anchor opportunities, as well as a, a wide 100-page technical report. Uh, and just to pick up on one particular point, which is around uh, how is this all going to be funded, certainly I can't say to you, uh, hand on heart this evening, that everything in there is going to be funded. What I can say is a deliberately uh, aspirational document. Um, it's there to catch the eye of governments, and I do think it, it fits quite neatly with some of today's announcements and the potential for a county deal uh, and how this might find some expression within that going forward. So just uh, in terms of the um, recommendations, there are two in there. One is to endorse uh, the documents listed in paragraph 3.2. Uh, and the second is the addition, um, that is to potentially bring forward a, if you like, a ninth um, anchor opportunity, which is around the potential to develop a digital or creative hub, um, which is um, detailed or explained in paragraph 4.8 of the uh, report chair. Uh, and so the recommendation is to um, bring forward a £50,000 budget for feasibility work to be funded from the business rate pilot reserve. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Andy. A really excellent report, um, fascinating, and, and good to see potentially the, the, the ninth opportunity added in as well. Um, so can I have a look, please, for any comments from outside of Cabinet on this or questions? Uh, no, so coming to Councillor Paul Hayward, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, unsurprisingly, uh, my thanks to uh, Andy and his team for this. It's one of these fantastic uh, recommendations that ticks all the boxes it, it, it works towards our green aspirations it helps towards doing the right thing for the planet and it's going to create thousands of jobs thousands of well-paid um uh, well-paid jobs that will help our local economy um and that trickle down effect helps our economy even further so i'm delighted uh, to be able to propose it um, Chair, uh, both recommendations as listed uh, on page 131. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Haywood. Uh, <laughs> in a race of the yellow hands, uh, youthful Dan Ledger won it once again. Councillor Ledger, please. As always. Uh, <laughs> happy to second it, Chair. I think he had a full area at Strategic Planning Committee, and yeah, happy to second it. Thank you. Fantastic. I, I must just give a bronze medal. Councillor Rowland, no, he doesn't need to come back in now, but uh, okay, thank you very much. Quicker next time. Yeah. Um, right, Amanda, can we go to a vote on this then, please? Members, if you could vote in the usual way, please. That's unanimous in favour, Chair. Thank you very much, Amanda, and thank you again, Andy. Uh, we now come to agenda item 19, the programme of meetings for 2022 and 2023, which is on a font so tiny on my screen. I'm just, OK, I can see that now. Um, right. Well, that all seems to make sense to me. Anybody uh, wish to speak on that? Or are we happy to recommend the, this programme of meetings? Um, I'll take it. Uh, oh, right. Chair. Council yes, Councillor John Loudon, please. Apologies. Thank you, Chair. I thought I uh, thought perhaps you were not just having problems seeing your screen for your uh, for your agenda, but also the screen to see us. But yeah. uh, clearly not. Yeah. So, uh, for for some of you, this this may seem to be perhaps the least sexy item on the agenda. But I would say no. It's equally as important uh, as any others as it sets out the uh, framework that allows us all to uh, continue uh, uh, with the work of uh, the council. So I would commend this to you. And uh, just to, while, I've got, while I've got the floor, Chair, just <laughs> keep you on your toes. Uh, so thank you to, to Henry and his colleagues, DSO colleagues for pulling this together as always. It's never an easy uh, task trying to timetable a, a, a complex set of 
meeting so that they they all intertwine but they don't clash with each other and uh, it's an opportune moment to uh, say thank you again to Henry and his colleagues for the work over the past year. Would you like that recorded for the minutes Councillor Loudon? I, I'm I'm sure that uh, DSO uh, will will do the right thing, Chair. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I, I would heartily endorse that as well. Thank you for saying that, uh, Councillor Loudon. Uh, so, coming next now, please to Councillor. Uh, oh, I'm just looking. Right, Councillor Joe Wibley, please. Hi there. Just a little point. Um, as Chair of Licensing, I've noticed on a couple of occasions um, in terms of the programme of meetings that licensing and enforcement has. Uh, clashed with planning um so we and there's quite a lot of people on both um uh, on both committees that's been sorted for the next planning meeting in uh uh next week um but just if if we can make a note that that where we have to change things at, at, you know at the last minute that that's not going to encourage attendance uh, uh either or both of um of the committees cheers thank you chair okay thank you very much for that Councillor Wibley, I can see uh, a problem uh, in 2023 February, I think, but I'm sure uh, the DSOs will take note of that and, and we'll try and um, get that sorted. Councillor Megan Armstrong, please. Well, thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, it's just about the poverty panel day. Uh, we, we had, as you know, we had our, our most recent meeting on Monday this week. Um, and the date that's down in the list there for the 23rd of May, unfortunately, has had to be because I can't attend that meeting. It's had to be changed now or provisionally until the, thir the following week, the 30th of May. And members of the panel did agree that that would that would be OK. And the officers who were there, presumably. So it's just an amendment, really, for that. And I also noticed that the, um, the dates of the poverty panel, um, I think it was agreed last year that we would have meetings every couple of months for, the, um, for, for, the, for this year. So, for, so they only go up until November. There's nothing following November. So presumably, I'm just looking at Henry now, um, I spoke to one, I spoke to Sarah today, the, the Democratic Services, and she said that she thought that could be sorted, you know, as and when uh, we, we reach the, perhaps at the next meeting, we can sort the dates out. But I'll take uh, Henry's advice on that. So it's just, and, and, I, and just to follow on from what Councillor Wibley said, I think occasionally it has happened that there have been meetings clashing with the poverty panel as well. I can't remember off the top of my head what they were. It's not happened very often, but it's often like emergency meetings that have come up and the poverty panel seems to have been forgotten <laughs> that it takes place. So just, just to bear that in mind for the future, that would be helpful. Thanks. OK, thank you, Councillor Armstrong. I'm sure that's noted as well. Um, and we, we've got a couple of other uh, panels that uh, will come forward um, but I'm sure we can deal with those later. Um, Councillor Nick Hookway, please. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, to echo Councillor Loudon's comments, uh, thanking um, Henry and other officers for putting together this very complex calendar. Um, my main concern concerns right at the bottom, the Strata Joint Scrutiny Committee. Uh, this hasn't met um, I think is I think we've actually missed two meetings. They've been cancelled. Uh, certainly, one meeting has been cancelled. I think it's two. Now, <clears throat> in view of the news that the uh, chief executive of Strata has now left that organisation, I think that a joint scrutiny committee meeting is uh, a matter of urgency now. And can I please ask uh, if Henry and his colleagues could um, get something organised for that as a matter as soon as possible, as a matter of urgency, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Councillor Hookway. So, uh, Councillor Bialik of Exeter has called a meeting for the, uh, the the three rings who rule them all. That's me, him, and the leader of uh, 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 um, Alan Connett of Timbridge. Um, in a month's time in Exeter, to look at exactly these governance issues as we go forward, because. Um, there is a, there is some thinking there that we have a scrutiny committee and an executive committee 
who seem to be replicating each other's work and there's a lot of rubber stamping going on. So that is that will actively come forward for consideration uh, and obviously, as you said, uh, also triggered uh, partly by the by the departure of the uh, of the uh, uh, chief executive, um, Mr. Whitlock of uh, of Strata as well. So that that is in focus. Um, but let's keep talking about that one. Thank, Thank you. you uh, Councillor Dan Ledger, please. Thanks, Chair. Just a quick point. I think we're being very optimistic with regards to strategic planning. I don't think I've had a meeting this year or and it, there won't be next year that that starts at two o'clock. There are all going to be morning meetings and they'll most likely be all day meetings because I like to, yeah, I know how we all like to, to drone on a little bit. But <laughs> with the local plan process in place, most of them will be all day meetings. So it's just a note for, for members with on that front. I don't want them booking in for, for the afternoons off work when actually they're going to be there all day with me. Okay. So, Henry, if we can change those to 6 a.m. starts, then... Please, <laughs> if you could, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, so, going sorry, back I'm out... Asking. Sorry, Henry, go on. I was asking, so is the intent, then, that you want them to start at 10? It'll be half nine or 10 o'clock, yeah. Usually, most of them, if they're an all-day meeting, they'll start at half nine. If it's not an all-day meeting, they'll start at 10. Yeah. And most of them will start at half nine. If I could put it at 10, and if you have to put it forward slightly, so, so be it. But if I put it at 10, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paul Miller, please. Thanks for letting me in, Chair. Apologies if I've missed it, but it was just mentioned that the Chief Executive of Strata has, has, has departed. I was only in correspondence with him a few weeks ago, and I'm not sure that members have been made aware of it. Um, I just wondered whether members could be briefed outside of the Cabinet on on what's going on, who, who um, you know, is, is there an interim Chief Executive at the moment? would be quite helpful given that I, I sit on the Strata Joint Scrutiny Committee and as Councillor Quay mentioned there hasn't been a meeting for quite a while now so uh, yeah no absolutely no, this only came through last week Councillor Miller so I, I will ask um, uh, Mark perhaps just to send out an email to members tomorrow just to confirm that as I understand it an interim may be being uh, looked at as a matter, matter for Strata but, but there are obviously further issues in terms of structural um, and, and governance issues that will come forward uh, partly as a result of Lawrence's departure. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'll make sure that there's an official notification goes out. Thank you for raising that. Uh, Councillor Sarah Jackson, I, please. Sorry, um, Chair, can oh, I sorry. just make a quick comment just because yeah, what wording is quite important. I mean, it's, it's just a simple case that Lawrence has resigned. Um, he essentially retired, basically, but he's resigned. So... Sometimes when the words are bandied about, like the departure, you know, people assume mm. other things. But it is a simple mm. case that Lawrence has resigned and um, we, we are in the process of uh, recruiting an interim whilst we ponder potentially um, the impact of a county deal on Strata uh, and further sort of collaboration with the county council and the other districts. But we can send out an email tomorrow just to give a bit more information. OK, thanks, Mark. As ever, rather better chosen words than mine. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Um, right, now, Councillor Sarah Jackson, please. Um, many thanks. Um, I'm not sure, um, uh, Councillor Loudon, did you propose this? I, I may not have used that word, but I think <laughs> the intent was there, Councillor Jackson. But if you wish to, I don't, I don't want to hog the limelight on this. It, I no, mean, right. this is, is now becoming the sexy item. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, I was going to propose subject to those changes, um, but I'm happy to second subject to the changes that have been highlighted. Um, just one query to Henry. Obviously, we've got, uh, we've got a couple of other working um, groups and panels and um, whatever that's that's um, ongoing uh, that aren't captured in here, but perhaps I mean I'm thinking member development for for example um, doesn't have a um, a structure of meetings just yet, but that's something that I'd like to see coming forward so that people can plan ahead. Um, once this is approved and goes to council and is is approved, um, how straightforward is it to add uh, additional meetings to this document? Or will they not be captured in this document? 
That's very sure. Thank you. <laughs> I thank you all for your kind words earlier as well. I should I should add. Um, but certainly I'll take that on behalf of the team. I didn't prepare this, obviously. It's not, not my <laughs> skill set. Um, the, uh, there's, there's, there's an issue with just the length of the document, really. Uh, yeah, there's, there are things that are not on there. It's, we've tried to keep it as concise as we can. So if we could populate the whole thing with all that goes on. Uh, and there's, there's also an element of an ad hoc nature to some of the, some of the meetings as well, which means it doesn't get programmed in, in quite the same way. So uh, there's an element of forces for courses. If members want to have various things on there that are not pleased to say, we can we can tinker at any time. We quite routinely go on and, and, and cut things through and, and change dates to, to, to suit, as you, as you well know. So this is really more of a sort of general framework that we try and adhere to as, as best we can. I hope that helps. Perfect, thank you. Thanks, Henry. I'm going to take your proposal, Sarah, and perhaps look to Councillor Loudon to second your proposal. You know, yes, he's thumb, thumbs up there. Uh, nobody else commenting at this stage. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Do we need to? Yes, we do need to vote. Do we need to vote on this, Henry? Or just noted? Oh, I think just noted. No, we'll, yeah. just take we'll just do that. OK. Sorry, Amanda, we got, got excited at that point, but, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Well, as John said, there was surprising uh, excitement in that in the end. Um, agenda item 20 then uh, is about an exemption to standing orders uh, for the appointment of... Oh, I'm just terribly sorry, Megan. I, 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 I missed you at the... Sorry, I, ju I just want to clarify that if it's just being noted, as, as, as Sarah said just now, those changes will be taken into account, won't they? Even though they're noted. OK, we haven't voted on that, but uh, as long as they're in there that's fine thanks yeah, sorry, yeah. just to clarify this this will ultimately go on to council but we will pick up we'll oh, pick yeah. up the change oh yeah of course yeah 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 thank you thanks Lovely. Chair. okay thank you very much so for agenda item 20 exemption to standing orders the appointment of legal assistance for cranbrook town center and we have a report from thea billeter cranbrook's new community manager thea please I don't think Thea's with us tonight, Chair. It doesn't look like it, so... Um, Chair, the, the exemption is, it is simply, it's an extension of an existing contract that we already have. Um, the, the contractor in question um, wrote the original Section 106 agreement for um, Cranbrook, and it is just to, to continue on with the MOU work. I've done Mark's work for him here. Mark, you can go home. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll open the beer now. <laughs> <laughs> so that well, well done. There we go. He's he's a good clerk, Mark, isn't he? Um, so excellent. In which case, we can see from that that we have a recommendation, which is that cabinet notes the attached request for the exemption to standing orders approval form attached in respect to the appointment of Burgess Salmon to provide legal assistance in the drafting of the Cranbrook Town Centre Memorandum of Understanding and associated Section 106 Deeds of Variation. Um, so, Marianne, Councillor Marianne Rickson, please. I just thought this was so exciting that I would like to recommend approval. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Jack Rowland. Yeah, please second it. Okay. view of uh, Councillor Ledger's uh, officer role. <laughs> okay. Um, right, so we do need to vote on this one, so Amanda, please. Thank you, Chair. Members, if you could vote in the usual way, please. That's nine votes in favour, Chair. Thank you very much for that, and thank you, uh, Councillor Clark Ledger, as well, for your help. Uh, we now come to item 22, uh, the refurbishment of the Sidmouth changing rooms. And we have a report here from our strategic lead for finance, Simon Davies. Simon. Missed out, count, Missed um, out. item 21, Chair. Well, There's another exemption oh, to standing orders. I you don't want to miss my, on it. my tiny font is so... I don't know if you've noticed, I have three different types of glasses. So I've got these ones. I've got these ones and I've got these ones and none of them can read what's on the right hand screen. Um, right. So I can uh, 21 chair. Thank you very much. The exemption from standing orders, the appointment of Hardesty Jones. Now it said we have 
Ed Freeman coming to have a chat with us about this. But uh, Ed, are you there, or or Dan? Can you perhaps uh, help? He, he, earlier? Yeah, it's another one for Dan, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, tell, I should ask Mark really. <laughs> Mark, can you just help us with this one again? It's a similar explanation, isn't it? Yo, he's, cracked open, he's cracked open that beer now. Mark's gone as well. I know he is there. Okay. Sorry, Mark. Oh, I was just writing an email about Strata. Um, we're, we're, item 21? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not here. So just if you okay. can explain very quickly. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Um, so essentially, in, in similar format to um, the, the report that uh, Dan just outlined with regard to Burgess Salmon, this is a, a similar one um, in respect of Hardest Street Jones, and so that we can have a, an economic needs assessment or, uh, for, the, for the local plan. So it's to confirm action that we've taken with regard to that, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, we should, uh, I shall, let me just ask for anybody outside of Cabinet, uh, but I'll come now. So coming to Councillor Dan Ledger, please. Thanks, Chair. Happy to propose the cost shared between all four authorities in question, uh, and it needs to be done for the local plan. Thank you. Councillor Paul Haywood, please. Thank you, Chair. Happy to second. And uh, uh, I'd just like you know, really a comment that all these names seem to be sort of small villages in Somerset that you drive through every now and again. But uh, yes, happy to second. <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah. That could have an interesting local history. So, uh, excellent. Uh, let's, Amanda, please take us to a vote on that again. Certainly, Chair. Members could vote, please. That's nine votes in favour of the recommendation, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for that. Now we come to Agenda Item 22, the refurbishment of Sidmouth. Uh, smoking pool, changing rooms, and report from Simon Davey, our strategic lead for finance. Simon, please. Thank you, Chair. A short report, hopefully self explanatory. Um, the request is coming to you at, at the request of LED. So, members may remember, in terms of this, was one of the schemes that was considered by the budget setting capital allocation um, group um, to go forward in our capital programme, but it was. Um, rejected at that stage to be further considered by the LED forum in terms of the, the amount of work going on with LED at the moment in terms of our, our leisure strategy. So the capital programme for LED, at, well, East Devon assets that are operated by LED, um, only essential health and safety uh, capital items went through and a number of our others were put to one side for further debate. This one, however, LED are keen that we do consider before those other projects in that they feel it's important for uh, customer service at, at Sydney Swimming Pool. Um, they've attached their reports as a link in terms of the number of customer complaints they've received, etc. The request is that we meet this out of our revenue budget, which we can do in terms of the, the budget approvals in place. But it's for, ideally, it would, it would have gone to the LED forum. Uh, but the timing of it hasn't allowed that. So with your permission, it's come straight to Cabinet. Um, the decision for members is, is whether you wish to meet this out of your budget resources. Um, the last two bullet points on the report refer to the budget available, how much of the national funding is left, um, and also the likely commitment that you'll have to LED for the remaining quarter of the financial year in order to meet their additional losses. Um, I can add some more questions on that if needed, but hopefully that, that explains the position to you. Thank you, Simon, very much. Uh, so can I look for any questions or comments from outside of Cabinet, please? So none there. So uh, coming into Cabinet, uh, oh no, sorry, going back outside, Councillor Paul Miller, please. Thanks, Chair. A bit late there. Um, yeah, just wanted to, to endorse uh, this proposal. Um, and as Vice Chair of the Forum, um, along with Councillor uh, Hawkins, we we decided this this did need to go to, to the Cabinet, straight to Cabinet, um, rather than a late report to the Forum. Um, we, do, we do think on this occasion that um, this specific project deserves, deserves this funding. 
um, because of the complaints and because it will increase, it will likely increase footfall and membership at the Sidmouth um, at the, the Sidmouth Centre. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that this isn't money to LED. I feel this is money to to, to, to the council because it's it's our asset. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, requests that come coming forward, as we know from LED, and it does beg the question what the Conservatives were doing in power for uh, in the last twelve years, given. Um, you know, given the number of, of requests we have to deal with right now, but I do think this one is urgent to, to be to be taken. I hope Cabinet will approve it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Miller, for, for that comment. Uh, Councillor Nick Hookway, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Simon, for your report. Um, <clears throat> I'm afraid I've got some concerns about this uh, uh, particular request. Um, what the, I was on the budget setting and capital allocation group in December. We had a huge meeting there and took some considerable time to uh, decide exactly what um, uh, budget requests were going to go through. And we said at the time that there, we would only deal with health and safety uh, um, matters. Um, this isn't a health and safety matter. Uh, sadly, for um, in that case. Uh, we also have the leisure strategy in place and we're hoping to have a report from Strategic Leisure very shortly so that we can make a, uh, a decision, a long-term decision about um, how we're going to uh, refurbish pools and, and, and deal with pools. And so I'd like to defer this decision, please, if possible, uh, until such times as we've seen the report from Strategic Leisure. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Councillor Hookway. So you're, you're proposing a different recommendation, which is for deferral of this item to go back to LED first or, or to a later cabinet? Well, back to the um, monitoring forum to await the report of the uh, strategic leisure for the leisure strategy, please. OK, all right, thank you. Noted. Um, Councillor oh, Simon David, please. Sorry, Chair, I didn't want to butt in. I just wasn't sure, as Chair, whether you're aware that Peter Gilpin, Chief Exec of LED, was in the meeting and happy to probably take questions. No, no, I, I wasn't. And thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, and uh, if Peter, if it, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's have a couple more comments. And then if Peter, if you'd like to speak, please do. Uh, I hope you've got the capacity to put your yellow hand up, Peter. But if you haven't, just shout. Um, so let's come to Councillor Jack Rowland uh, next, please. Thanks, Luke. I, I think as uh, Peter's actually attending the meeting, I'd be quite happy to hear from him if he's got anything more to add um, before I make any further comment, because I think it might be important to hear from him. OK, thanks, Jack. That's a good suggestion. Peter, apologies, I can't see you on my screen. Would you like to come in at this point to to uh, add some comment? Yes, you would. So over to you, please, Peter. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, actually, the, the awaiting the leisure uh, strategy is one of the reasons why uh, this is important, I think, to go ahead with now. Um, we've been looking at refurbishing these changing rooms for a number of years. And we were fairly well advanced on, on a very significant improvement about three years ago. And then a number of factors have delayed it, one being obviously COVID, the second being the leisure strategy, um, and the third being obviously the capital constraints that I recognise the council are facing. But what we've got at Sidmouth Swimming Pool are changing rooms that are 30 years old and have never been refurbished. And they're in a pretty poor state. Um, and we were looking to go ahead with these as I say, about three years ago. But um, knowing the leisure strategy was coming and knowing that a, a longer term view was needed, we actually asked for these works to be postponed until the leisure strategy um, gave a long term view of the, of the swimming pool and until we could sort of look at that in conjunction with the other facilities in Sidmouth because you've got to look at them in the round. So in the meantime, what we've got are changing rooms, which are now very shabby. We're getting complaints pretty much daily. I've forwarded three to Simon Davey this morning that we've had just this week, and it's only Wednesday. Um, so these are affecting our customers quite badly, and we are seeing a lot of people um, leave their, lose their, mem leave their memberships and uh, stop swimming. So with the next financial year coming um, and the constraints we're all looking at, um, these works 
at a relatively cheap price would see the changing rooms enhanced for a very short term period for two or three years whilst we consider the long term future of the pool and the other facilities in Sidmouth. So it's a makeover to address the concerns of the public and which would see a financial benefit for the next financial year, um, as well as much improved customer satisfaction. So, so I would really like to see these works done um, and I would appreciate support. Thank you, Chair. That, thanks, Peter, very much for that. It's very helpful. Can I ask you a question, which is just a little bit of detail then around, um, you know, I don't know, the three complaints today. I mean, what are we looking at? Loose tiles, grubbiness, shower curtains, falling off rails. I mean, what, where, where are the problems? Yeah, so they are. It is the state of the changing rooms mainly. Um, they, are, um, nine, they are 30 years old. Um, lack of privacy so um, and what we've got as well what we intend to do is we have we've done quite a bit of market research 70% of our users in Sidmouth Pool are female and yet the men's changing rooms are significantly bigger than the ladies changing rooms so what we intend to do is swap them around and give the ladies a larger changing room and also to put some cubicles in those what would be the new ladies changing rooms um, because privacy is an issue for them as well as it is for some of the gentlemen but the gentlemen will have cubicles in what would become the men's changing as well. So that would be one of the changes. And then we would like to put in new showers, uh, new showers and new um, better toilets, which would be part of any future uh, improvement anyway. So, so that's the main concern is that they're very tired and very shabby and people feel very uncomfortable changing in them. OK, thank you very much for that additional information. Very helpful. Thank you. So can I come back to uh, Councillor Jack Rowland, who kindly just stood aside then um, at this point? Thank you. And uh, thank you, Peter, for that information. We've heard um, earlier this evening about um, a number of factors where action hasn't been taken earlier by previous administrations. And here we've got another example of that happening because from what's just been said, there's been no real maintenance on this for th during that 30 years and um, previous promises about uh, the refurbishing have not been kept. Um, I chaired the uh, budget setting and capital allocation uh, panel last December and uh, Councillor Hooke is quite right. The number of projects that we had to consider. Um, we couldn't afford to do everything at that time. So we called into uh, the equation what was really urgent in terms of health and safety. I suppose what, I, it's, uh, what I'd like to know, I can see Tim Child is here, is this getting to the stage where because of the state of the facility, it could actually be classified under a health and safety issue now um, if things don't change within the, the very near future, despite the fact that we've got the leisure strategy um, coming along fairly soon. So there's okay. a question to Tim, if I'm putting him on the spot. <laughs> um, now, again, I've got limited uh, to see. Tim, are you there? Yeah. I yes, see you. Him. yes, yes, Chair. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I visited the change, to be honest, I probably want to bring Peter in on this as well. I visited the changing rooms at the end of last week to have a look at, um, and hence obviously drafted a report with Simon. Um, is it a health and safety issue? I struggle to say yes, it is. Um, it is It is very dated, um, not particularly pleasant changing facilities, picking up on the, the point also that Peter made regarding lack of cubicles, yes, absolutely. And also just a bad arrangement generally with the lar much larger change room being for the men who actually required a smaller change room because of numbers. Um, I can't sort of hand on heart say that uh, I picked up anything from a health and safety perspective in my visit, but obviously Peter's more familiar with them. So Peter might want to come in either to confirm or, or, or not with what I've just said. Peter, would you, would you like to come in again, please? Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like Tim, if I'm honest, I struggle to say there's a health and safety issue in that we're not putting anybody in danger of an accident, but it is it is 95% customer service and the real appalling changing rooms that we're, we're offering, which just aren't, aren't suitable. And what I forgot to mention as well is that um, 
the, by rearranging the change rooms, we create more family changing as well for, for mothers and, and fathers with children and for people who um, we, we have to get away from unisex and, and sex gender orientated changing as well. So we can adapt the changing rooms to be more, um, more user friendly as well. Okay, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Tim, uh, for, for that. Uh, coming to Councillor Marianne Rickson next, then, please. Well, I must confess to feeling conflicted about this one, um, but bearing in mind the comments that um, Councillor Rowland made and Councillor Hookway, um, it, it is a bit late on in the day that we've been made aware of this. Um, but what would tip the balance for me would be if the government was to cough up the money that we haven't received to date, because that way I would have no hesitation because we would have we would definitely have the money. Yes, I mean that is a that is a a, a problem, isn't it? Um, okay, so uh, coming next, please, to Councillor Jeff Young. Jeff, please. Um, I have to declare an interest that um, most of my family are LED uh, members, and they're also keen swimmers. Um, but at um, Exmouth, uh, but I, I would say that after thirty years. Um, any decorating needs uh, redoing um, and in a swimming pool environment um, I think it's uh, it, it's almost inevitable that um, after 30 years it would need to be uh, uh, some repairs. I'm just concerned that um, men will be walking into a pink tiled changing room and ladies will be walking into a blue tiled changing room. Um, that would be a bit... Let me let me help you draw a line there, Councillor. <laughs> <laughs> there are sensitivities to all of this. Yeah, uh, um, but, but um, no, I, I would I would support this expenditure. Thank you. Okay, coming coming back to uh, Peter with news of the tiling arrangement. <laughs> Peter, please. Yeah, no, it, um, I'll just put my hand down. It. Oh, will sorry. Be, uh, it'll be gender neutral. Um, color changing colors. Um, perhaps what I, I would just quickly, if I may, Chair, re, uh, um, explain why we've asked for this to come to Cabinet, and that's because um, the timing of the monitoring forums would not allow us to get this done before the new financial year. If it were approved today by Cabinet, then we can get these works done before the end of March and have the change rooms ready for the um, start of the new financial year, which would certainly help us to... Um, recover revenue quicker and, and that's why it's been brought to cabinet was because um, we can get this work done before the end of this financial year and benefit from it in the next financial year if it's approved tonight if it's not then it will go back to monitoring forum I'm sure I think this is essential and will probably still get done but um, it will be a, a two or three months before we can we can start Thanks. Simon, Simon would know more about the finance and the timing of the finance okay all right, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, coming to Councillor John Loudon, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I, I can understand the arguments that Peter Gilpin has put forward. I mean, they're, they're obviously sensible arguments. I've got some concerns because I'm sat here and we've got an agenda item that has come in late. This is really the first opportunity as members we've had to understand the item, and I'm feeling quite uncomfortable with that because... That's not what I was expecting as a process we as Cabinet would have. That said, I also, I've listened to uh, what Councillor Rowland said about the capital, the capital allocations panel. Um, uh, I remember it was a very long meeting with an awful lot of detail and, and, and there was uh, some, uh, there was discussion, wasn't there, if I've recalled it correctly, or whereby um, members said, look, we, we want to put, we can't make a decision at this point for various reasons, if, if, I, if I remembered that correctly. And I'm just slightly nervous because I get the point that Peter Gilpin makes, and, and, and this really does pain me to say this, but, you know, if it's the changing rooms at Sidmouth today, then tomorrow it's something else because that's equally as 
necessary and important. You know, both Peter and Tim have been honest and said it's not health and safety. If it was health and safety, um, my, my, my gut feeling would be we, we have to do what we can. But I'm I'm struggling with this, uh, if I'm honest, and I, I know, and I, I think I'm going to be saying no to this, you know, for the reasons I've just outlined, or at least I'm going to abstain. I don't thank like you. to do this. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Lau. Uh, um, it's 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 difficult this because I'm sure, and Peter's seen this, and and I and I know respects it. I mean, we do as this administration try to stick with with process. Um, equally, I can understand <laughs> that, I mean, if, I suppose if we're honest as well, John, um, you know, we, we have had in the last two months or so to absolutely grind the gears to get the car parking strategy going. And we've been, you know, jumping through hoops to get that. And sometimes these things do come about where there is a genuinely urgent need. So I'm just putting that as a counter, a, a, a counterbalance to that. But the process hasn't been ideal. Agreed. A uh, councillor Megan Armstrong, please. Oh, sorry to check. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, Thanks. Just a very simple. Bearing in mind what everybody said, and I, I, I also feel conflicted um, about it, especially now having heard it's not a health and safety issue, and I know how difficult decisions were at, at that meeting, um, and. I just want to ask through you, Chair, I just want to ask Simon again, uh, and it's in his report, I'm sure, but I just want to be really clear. Is the money available to do this? Honestly, is the, is the money available to do this? I, I just want to know that answer, and then I'll, I might well abstain myself, I think. I, I'm not sure yet. But Okay, thank you, Megan. Uh, yes, yeah, Simon, can, can I bring you in there, please? <laughs> you can. There's... Um... For you, Chair. Uh, there's two answers to that, Councillor Armstrong. Sorry that it's a little bit conflated. In the, the reason it's coming to Cabinet and Cabinet can make a decision is there is budget available in terms of the approved budget. So at the moment, you, you have a net budget available of 177000 However, that money was set aside to meet the shortfalls because of COVID for LED. There's another quarter to go, quarter four, which we don't know how much that will cost us. But the estimate and the prudent estimate is it will be no more than 100,000. So there is scope in the budget to approve the scheme at 40,000. So that's straightforward. The mm -hmm. reason it's a bit more nuanced than that, and I have put it in the report, is of that 177,000 left, that's made up of two parts. There's 60,000 that's the National Leisure Recovery Fund element. If you remember, we got funding about 300,000 out of the fund. 209,000 of that was carried forward into this financial year to use um, on leisure recovery. So at the moment, there's 60,000 left of that um, and 117,000 of our own resource budget, which makes up the 177. So that's why. It's a little bit confusing in terms of there is net budget available, but only 60,000 of, of the recovery fund is part of that. The rest is East Devon's own budget resources. Mm. I hope that's clear. Sorry, Councillor. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, Simon, can I, can I ask a question, which is that um, I mean, you can sense there's a little bit of you know, genuine, um, I don't know, constitutional discomfort around some, some of the cabinet members. Who, 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 and I know the intention isn't for, for, for cabinet to be bounced, but it's, it feels a little bit in that area. Um, if the next LED forum is on the 1st of March, Henry, can you remember when the next cabinet is? It must be pretty soon after that, isn't it? It'll be, it'll be at the beginning of March. It's okay. the 2nd of March, Chair. So, 2nd of March, well, the next day. Um, Simon, would that be too late if LED had a discussion about it and then for this to be included in next year's financial plans? Yep, we, we can do that, Chair. Okay. Um, 
all right, well, let's see what, what further discussions. I mean, you know, that might be the way of splitting the difference on this. Okay, Councillor Ledger, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm just really going back to the report and looking at this kind of in the round of it being um, looking at the, the £2 million that it's going to cost to do the refurb uh, and the extension. Now, that's only going to arrive through one of three ways, through um, grants that we're able to receive, through our own capital programme or through developer contributions. Now, so that £2 million, I don't think the, I think we can all agree there's not going to be significant, due to the constraints of SIDMA, there's not going to be significant development there. So we're not going to see anywhere near the level of £2 million worth of developer contributions. Um, our capital programme is very stretched year on year. Um, so we, we aren't going to realise that £2 million from our, our capital fund. So it really, to my mind, this all kind of relies on LED being able to get grants. Now, the likelihood of that is it's going to be years' time. Now, that still leaves us with the position that they need to do works in the short term with the, these wider aspirations of the, the extension and everything. But thinking about it logically and realistically, this isn't going to happen for years. So to my mind, these works need to happen now so that, that we can then look after assets, then look forward. I was quite nervous at the start of this and I couldn't understand personally coming into the meeting, what was the rush with this? Um, but now having heard the, the debate and everything that's coming across, I think we do have the budget, let's get it done. Um, I'll happily propose that we, we move forward and get that done. But we need to be, we need to keep in mind that, that there is, it is part of that wider 2 million and when are we gonna find that funding? And that, I think that's the key issue here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Ledger. Uh, so we have a proposal there. Uh, coming back to Councillor Loudon, please. Note to self, Chair, never point, paint yourself into a corner. Uh, that's to myself, that is. Um, so you've, you've had a conversation there with Simon about the 1st of March LED forum, 2nd of March uh, cabinet. The, the, the question then, I suppose, goes back to, to Peter Gilpin. Does that still allow you to do what you were seeking to do, which is to, to start this or to get this into this year's financial year? I think that's what you were saying. I got that. To, I, that's, that's how I've taken it. And it seems to me, uh, uh, you may already have done this, but you, you will obviously need quotes, estimates and all of that uh, uh, and tendering. But if... If you haven't done that, it's an opportune moment to start it, isn't it? So that, uh, uh, so that if a positive decision comes out on the second of March, then it, it's all systems go. Uh, am, I, am I completing a number of things there, Chair? Well, before we come to Peter, can I just come to Henry, uh, please? Because he's got a he's got his hand up there, Henry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, it's just the timings for the first and the second and where, where things would need to go. So the LED monitoring forum is in the morning, thankfully, but it would require my team to type up the minutes from that and have the cabinet agenda recirculated that day, which I think may well present a, a, a very tight time frame, if I could put it like that. You know, super people they are, but uh, even, even for them, that might be quite tight. But, but even so, once it's been through cabinet and assuming it's agreed, it would then have to go on to council because there's no budget. So you're going to have to go through to April's council. So it's, it's going to delay it all then anyway. Well, not okay. delay it. End up, it would only be approved finally in April. Okay. Can I hold off Peter for a minute then and come, come, come to uh, Councillor Jack Roden, please? Thanks. Um, I'll make the point I was going to make in a minute, but the point that Henry just made, Simon said we've got the money in the budget, so I don't see why it has to go to council. I'm, I'm so sorry, councillors. Yeah, yeah. So, Simon, I thought was he, he misunderstood what I was asking. So there is a budget, so it wouldn't be to go to council. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And that um, was, yeah. I think um, just going back to the budget setting and capital allocation uh, meeting last December, um, this subject was on the agenda for that meeting, and a decision was made to uh, refer it to the uh, LED uh, monitoring forum. I can't help thinking that we've already heard from Councillor Miller as the Vice Chairman of that, of that panel, and 
I believe Sam Hawkins actually, as chair of that panel, asked for it to be put onto the agenda tonight. So bearing in mind that the chair and the vice chair of that panel have already considered this and asked for it to be considered tonight, I can't see anything different coming back from the LED forum that's going to be happening at the beginning of March. So I'm more of a mind now, having heard the whole debate this evening, to actually um, second uh, what Councillor Ledger put forward. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Um, uh, well, coming to Councillor Jeff Young as well, then, please. Uh, I, I'd just like to second the proposal from uh, uh, Councillor Ledger. Thank you. OK, so we've got you get the bronze medal there, Jeff, because Jack's just done that in the silver position. <laughs> So, um, well, um, I think that was a really helpful and rounded discussion. And I, th I think it was important as Cabinet to, to make the, you know, the constitutional points we've made. Uh, but um, I think, well, we'll have to go to the vote to see whether common sense prevails in the end. But thank you, everybody, for contributions. Uh, so we have a proposal and the seconder, I'm just looking for, bear with me, because I have got it here, the actual wording, uh, which I will have there in just right. Okay, so that's the reason, and then I'll just, uh, blah, 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 blah. Right, the recommendation is that Cabinet agree to utilise £40,000 of the approved budget for LED to support the refurbishment of Sidmouth changing rooms. Uh, Amanda, can you take us to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Members, if you could vote in the usual way, green ticks in support, red crosses if you're against, and raise your electronic hand if you're abstaining. Thank you. So that's six votes in favour, Chair, one vote against, and two members abstaining. Thank so you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And, um, Thank you very much to those who abstained and voted against as well. Perfectly understand why. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to make sure we, we don't get in this position again. Because um, I am I think, I, I like to think I'm quite generous with adding late items to the agenda. But we've, we've got to be very careful with this. Anyway, Peter, good luck with your, uh, with your pots of paint and your brushes. You can get them out now and uh, get in there. <laughs> so thank you. Right, we He's now... Sorry, Mr. Gilpin's already gone. He's already gone. So he's getting. He's got these brushes are in the turps, and that's he, had his, he had his decorator own rules on, I think. He's taking <laughs> money and run, Chair. Okay. okay, very good. Right. In which case, then that was agenda item twenty-two. We now come to agenda item twenty-three business rates, the COVID nineteen additional relief fund. Now. Potentially, we have a report here from Libby Jarrett, the service lead for revenues, benefits, customer services, corporate fraud and compliance. Uh, Libby, I'm aware that you have got a hell of a frog in your throat at the moment. Would you, I mean, if you want to keep it, if you just wish, I mean, well, do speak as few words as you, as, as you wish. Please don't feel the need to, um, to uh, eulogise this report, but uh, over to you anyway. Chair, yeah, we're oh. currently still on YouTube. Good. I thought it was a Part B report. No, that's no, the next one. That's, yeah. Thanks, Amanda. That's the one about the protocol for Devon wide response to sport victims in modern slavery. I'll keep quiet and leave, sorry. You see, these clerks, they get above themselves sometimes. <laughs> so, Libby, over to you, however briefly you'd like to do this. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, so this report introduces um, the COVID Additional Relief Fund. Um, the government announced this fund back in March 21, um, where they'd be providing funding to local authorities to implement a new rate relief scheme uh, for businesses impacted by the pandemic. Um, this is because the government were closing by bringing in new legislation um, to prevent certain sectors um, of businesses seeking a reduction um, in value 
um, due to the impacts of the pandemic. That legislation has now come in, that came in in December. So that is now not a valid reason for businesses to um, appeal to the valuation office um, because of the pandemic. So this scheme um, is really sort of uh, reflecting um, that sort of shift. So for East Devon, we've been allocated uh, 2.1 million um, and it, the way that will work, we'll be reimbursed based on the funding amounts awarded. So if we don't spend it all, um, it, it will be, um, we won't um, keep it. Um, so we'll only get reimbursed with what we spend. Um, the, the funding um, for this scheme is in relation to the current financial year. The government are expecting relief to be awarded in this financial year. And of course, we're now in February, so we've actually only got this month and next month to go. Um, and, and although they announced the scheme in March, we actually only got the government guidance on the 15th of December. So um, we do need to um, move at pace um, in order to develop that scheme. Um, and that's partly driven because we've got annual bills that will be going out in, in March and, and to, to also ensure that we get that support to businesses um, that haven't benefited from other rate relief schemes um, in this year before we go into next year. Um, as part of the government guidance, they have set out conditionality that we need to comply with in order to um, be compensated for any relief awarded. Um, but they've made it clear that as part of that guidance it is for local authorities to develop their own policies. So, so what, we've, um, what we've needed to do is to develop a scheme and the approach we've taken is to look at a scheme that is mainly in two parts. The first part is to um, look at a formula based um, scheme. That means that we can direct the majority of that funding out to businesses by modelling our data. And then the second part is to have a sort of special cases provision. It provides that safety net for those that haven't met the, the formula criteria to be able to still apply. Um, what that approach, um, we can liken that to the way the grant schemes have worked. So um, the government have provided um, a criteria based funding of grants and then they've provided uh, a discretionary pot of money for local authorities to sort of have their own scheme for other businesses that haven't met the, the main scheme. So it sort of mirrors that approach. Um, as we will be using, um, so sorry, I've just lost my train of thought. So as, as part of that, that's the sort of approach we're taking. Obviously, as part of the government, there are a number of ineligible businesses um, that cannot uh, be considered under this scheme. Um, so, for instance, those that have benefited from the expanded retail relief, um, those that are claiming under the airport <coughs> grounds operation scheme, uh, precepting authorities, um, empty premises, um, those claiming the nursery discount, and obviously we've got a number of businesses that don't actually pay rates because they're benefiting from 100% small business rate relief. So we need to take all of those out of the equation before we can start looking at what we're left with. So um, as we talked about, we've modelled, um, as the report highlights, we've modelled our data to, um, to look at what that formula criteria scheme um, could be based on stripping out the main government schemes. So we've, we've approached that in three stages. So the first stage was to remove the ineligible businesses. Um, and that is shown in, sorry, bear with me. Take your time, no, no, no. Sorry. no. <laughs> As well. So it's part, um, sorry, yeah, so part five of the um, policy, part five of the report is to look, the way we've looked at that um, formula based criteria is to um, model our, our data. So the first stage was to remove the ineligible businesses as per government guidance. Um, that meant um, that we were removing 1,557 accounts 
um, that had a net charge of 9.4 million. So when, if we just roll back slightly, just um, as the report highlights, but 7,260 rating assessments, um, but of those 4,411 have zero rates because they're benefiting from 100% rate relief or they're um, on empty exemptions. Um, this means that we, we our starting point is 2,849 with a net charge of 28.7 million. We then strip out the government ineligible businesses um, and that brings us down to 1,292 accounts uh, with a net rate of 19.2 million. So um, what we then wanted to look at is any local exclusions um, as part of our local policy. And what we've done is we've done that in two um, uh, parts. Part one is by category of business, um, that we uh, are proposing should be excluded. And part two is by looking at the SCAT code. Now, as part of the government guidance, what they did when they calculated our funding, and that is included in the report, they looked at the GVA impact by SIT code, which is the standard industrial classification to determine those business, the level of impact and then all the business rating assessments have a SCAT code and then they cross-reference those to then determine our, our level of funding. And what we've done is reflected that in our modelling to ensure that those who have had the biggest impact on GVA are, we're, we're ensuring that we're targeting support um, that takes account of that. So, um, so part of what we're looking at is to remove certain um, exclude certain rating assessments from being um, eligible under the CAF scheme through our local policy. Um, and the rationale for that um, is explained in the report. But just to sort of reassure members, um, there are a number, when we talk about business and rating assessments, uh, what we have to remember is there are a lot of rating assessments that aren't necessarily your typical business that you will think of because it is non-domestic rates. So we also, so we are, we have rating assessments such as beach huts. So they're not businesses, but we're recommending that they're excluded um, from being eligible under the CAF scheme. We're also proposing that we um, exclude things like um, tele, uh, telecommunication masks, um, uh, photovoltaic farms, um, advertising hoarding, communication stations, stables and loose boxes, um, all of those. And there's more detail in the report um, because a lot of those are sort of infrastructure related uh, assessments, but they've also um, been insulated from the um, adverse impacts of the pandemic. So the exclusions are set out in stage two. That means um, we are then left um, if we adopt those local uh, exclusion with 606 accounts um, with a total net charge of 7.3 million. Um, and that means we can provide support of 28% um, rate relief, um, also proposing a cap of 30,000. Um, and and that, that would mean that we'd be utilizing about 91% of our funding through the main part of the scheme leaving a balance to support businesses to come through the special cases provision. So the first recommendation is to adopt the policy um, and, to, uh, and the scheme is outlined in the report, the policies in the background papers. And the second recommend, recommendation is to provide um, delegated authority so that we can make consequential changes, but more importantly, should we be in that position that we have funding left, that we can alter the percentages upwards to ensure that we um, um, utilize all of that government funding and target uh, support to businesses in the East Devon area. So I think that's quite a sort of, hopefully a brief, um, and I appreciate it's quite a technical report, Happy to answer any questions um, that you may have. Well, that was fantastic, Libby. Um, thank you so much, particularly in your own personal circumstances. Amazing, <laughs> thank you. 
Uh, Councillor Paul Miller, please. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I was planning to be at the briefing arranged earlier, but the last minute it was uh, the time has changed. No, there, there, there were good reasons for that, Councillor Miller, that you're not aware of at the moment. So is there a oh, question oh. or another comment? Yeah, of course there is, Chair, um, which is, um, is there a recording of that briefing? Um, there, so members, yes. Which wasn't yeah. answered. You've been quite rude, Chair, but... I'm just confirming to you there is a recording and that's already been confirmed, yeah. All right, thanks very much. Cheers. Okay. Um, Councillor Steve Gazard, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, like Councillor Miller, I, I couldn't get to that uh, meeting. Um, but um, thanks to, to Libby, um, broke it down really um, easy for someone like me to, to, to understand. Um, and, and I'm grateful for that. And, and I think it's important that uh, Cabinet endorses a report and crack on and um, get this money out and uh, not let, let's not let send any of it back to central government. Let's use it for our um, businesses down here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gazard. For that, Councillor Jack Roden, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to, to Libby for her um, patience this evening and I know um, she's had quite a difficult time at the moment so congratulations for getting through that last last part of the presentation and doing the presentation earlier today. Um, also thanks to uh, George and her team who's I uh, understand has done all the modelling work and I think when you look at the detail in that modelling to see logically how it's been gone through to end up with a situation where to match what the uh, government uh, guidelines are saying that 91% of that money that we've uh, been given is going to be used, which allows for that tolerance for um, that other 9% to come back for special cases or uh, for some appeals to come back, um, shows the merits of what's been done in that modelling. Um, so without further ado, I'd actually like to move the two recommendations as shown on the uh, agenda paper on page 106. Do you want me to read them out or? Uh, yes, go on, please, Jack. Yes, please. Okay, so recommendation was, uh, one was endorsing the proposed uh, CRF discretionary scheme as set out section five of this report and the associated policy is approved. And two, delegating authority to the service lead the revenues, benefits, customer services, fraud and compliance in consultation with the deputy leader, portfolio holder for finance and section 151 officer to make consequential changes to the policy and if necessary, increase the percentage of relief and cut thresholds to ensure that government funding is fully directed to businesses in East Devon. Thank you very much, Councillor Rowland. Uh, Councillor Paul Hayward, please. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I too I, I would have liked to um, attend, but I understand that there's a need to, to change it and this does happen. Um, I too would like to thank uh, Libby and her team for the clarity of this report. It really couldn't have been clearer. It, it takes a while to read it, um, but actually when you get into it, the logic, as Councillor Rowland says, is irrefutable. We've done, we've done our duty, our due diligence. We've gone through each process, uh, you know, um, progressively and logically, and we've reached this conclusion. And it, it, it really can't be put any simpler than that. You know, 28% uh, business rates relief to those eligible businesses which have been taken through that funnel, and we've reached those 606. So I'm more than happy to second this, um, and let's spend every penny of it um, uh, to benefit those businesses that need it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Haywood. Uh, Councillor Sarah Jackson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to apologise uh, to uh, Libby. Um, I haven't had a chance to digest this report, so I'll be abstaining, but thank you so much. I appreciate these are uh, uh, pieces of work that need to be turned around very, very quickly, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that um, it would be something like I could support had I had the opportunity to really read and digest and understand that. Um, but thank you. That's, that's absolutely very good of you to say, uh, Councillor Jackson, and very fair. Um, and I'm aware that a number of members would have liked to have been at the time when it was originally scheduled, but for 
genuine reasons, it had to be changed uh, rather late in the day. Um, so I'll apologise to members for that because that, that, that shouldn't have happened, but um, we are where we are on that. Uh, so coming now to Councillor John Loudon, please. Chair, I'm just going to echo the comments that some of my colleagues have made uh, uh, congratulating Libby and the team for yet again turning around something like this quickly. Um, it can't be easy working uh, to the timetable that government sets uh, and, and having to deliver, you know, if, if we don't deliver this, then the money goes back to government. And as everybody else has said, you know, let's hope that we can uh, get 100 percent out there into the community. That's very much what we need to do. And, and, and I applaud you as well um, for making what, frankly, on, on, on the face of it, is a fairly impenetrable report, uh, one that even I can uh, uh, understand, albeit having two, two goes at, at hearing uh, your explanation. It is, so I would say to colleagues, something that's a bit like being at school, isn't it? If you let your, your attention wander just for a millisecond, then you're completely, uh, completely at sea. But no, thank you and uh, appreciate your work. Thank you very much, Councillor Loudon, for that. So we've heard from all speakers now. We have a proposer and a seconder for that. So Amanda, can we go to uh, a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Members, you can vote in the usual way, please. So that's nine votes in favour, Chair, and one abstention. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda, and very much it, Libby. How your voice has held out this evening, I don't know, but give me the give me the number of your pharmacy. Um, it looks like you may be sucking something already. I don't know, but anyway, well done. Thank you very much indeed for that incredible innings. Um, so, as far as the public part of our meeting is concerned. That now comes to an end, and I'd like to thank everybody, members of the public, who've been here today taking part. And I'll just wait now for us to come off air for part B.